Um, I, I wanted to also mention that, you know, and I should have put these pages, another crucial uh, point of this book, uh, uh, of this little intervention, which was actually 2009 and 10, after the, the financial crisis. So we're living through another kind of, um, you know, um, uh, stimulus program, right? We don't know. We haven't paid for the previous one, so we're now going to try to build a new one here, and we'll see what Moscow Mitch comes up with for, um, for uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, alternative to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi's. I, I won't, you know, use uh, bad language with her, but anyway, Moscow Mitch is uh, obviously uh, the leader of the pack here. So um, anyway, um, um, he does refer, and this is a very interesting thing to, to, to my mind and, and sort of something we should really think about, a new kind of mafia capitalism. He, he refers to it as mafia capitalism. And this is on pages 62 and 63. And he also speaks not about the disappearance of people in Portland, Oregon, or in Chile, 1973, but he talks here about the disappearance of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> the petty bourgeoisie, the middle bourgeoisie, and what he refers to in French as the grand, the high, haut uh, bourgeoisie, right? In a way. So this is a new arrangement of social class he's also looking at. He's hinting at terms of new new theory of class. So I'll just, I'll just uh, cite a little bit of this. Um, um, you know, this is, um, the mafia tends to replace bottom of page 62 with a bourgeoisie and capitalism takes on an essentially mafia-like character from the moment that the disenchantment of the world is completed. This disenchantment becomes then no longer relative, but absolute. There can no longer be any relative re-enchantment as was, for example, the advent of modern art. And this is a return to this question we had earlier about avant-garde possibilities. You know, I think this is an interesting section to kind of reflect upon. As was, for example, the advent of modern art rejecting the industrial art of which Flaubert speaks through the character of Jacques Arnaud, both from within and for bourgeois modernity. Now the French, Roland Barthes in particular, begins modernity literarily uh, in, with sentimental education of, of, of Flaubert, right? This is the advent of modernity. So it's no accident that Stiegler cho chooses uh, Flaubert, right? both within and for bourgeois modernity. When disenchantment becomes absolute, the power of the powerful plays out without consistence, without relation to otium of any kind, without the slightest belief, and therefore is an absolute cynicism, right? Which neither faith, with neither faith nor law. So it is within this epoch of mafia capitalism, that is of a capitalism without bourgeoisie, that one sees develop the systemic, I mean, excuse me, systematic state lie, drive-based politics, and an addictive consumerism induced by industrial populism. If fascism is a disease of bourgeois capitalism, the occurrence of which is a warning sign foreshadowing absolute disenchantment, then the becoming mafia of capitalism is not an accident, which would be more or less epiphenomenal, Rather, it is the normal and everyday functioning of, of such a capitalism. And he refers to, of course, Sarkozy was in power then. In this respect, Sarkozyism is not, unfortunately, if one can put it like this, a return of Petainism. So in a way, he's going well beyond all this study. You know, we have this tendency, Trump is a fascist and all of this. Mm. This is much worse than fascism, uh, you know, that uh, Stiegler is referring to, that we're living through, in a sense. This is not an adequate term. So anyway, it is something far more serious, more complex, and more difficult to think than the return of the same old song. The middle classes will soon disappear because they have been proletarianized by the development of consumerism. This is not to say that they have been pauperized, and this is interesting. The disappearance is not about their pauperization. Yeah. They could be on the Merrill Lynch $1 million in equity client list, but still be ready to disappear right? Still, yep. it's becoming an extinct class in a way. This is not to say that they've been barbarized. The former is not the consequence of the latter. It is to say that the middle classes are no longer any kind of petty bourgeoisie, not because they have been barbarized, but through a symbolic misery, 
And we read a little bit of that, those mm. first 13 pages of uh, symbolic misery. Symbolic impoverishment or immeasuration. I like to call it psychic impoverishment, but I, you know, I'll go with symbolic impoverishment. Mm -hmm. in the sense, and through an aesthetic and noetic proletarianization, without odium, without excess, for example, to the instrumental practice, which was such a delight to Roland Barthes, for whom a true appreciation of the music of Schumann can only derive from its interpretation, that is, from the practice of playing it mm -hmm. on the piano as he explains in Musica Practica, a sentiment which also lies on the refrain constantly repeated to Pierre Schaeffer by his father, work on your instrument. Anyway, in so doing, the father reminds us that the odium is work, that work always involves an instrument, and hence, that so does otium. The petty bourgeoisie, even though it is not rich, nevertheless belongs to the bourgeoisie insofar it has access to something beyond subsistence. Right, so not necessary, socially necessary labor time in Marx is not really any more as relevant as it was to 19th century industrial capital, or really to Fordism. You know, he's, he's thinking post Fordism here, and can emancipate itself from the pure necessity of reproducing its labor power, and therefore liberate itself from pure negotium, that is, from completely calculable exchange. You know, he's setting up this opposition between the otium and the negotium, right? The petty bourgeois are able to be music lovers, amateurs, right? <laughs> music, the French are good. You're just an amateur, right? <laughs> what was once a privilege of the mobility, nobility, excuse me, became in the 19th, I mean, it's a good slip, mobility, nobility, mm -hmm. in the 19th century, par excellence, that of the bourgeoisie, then became as well the privilege of the petty bourgeois. This is what was liquidated by the extension of consumerism to all classes. Through what I have described with Nicholas Donas as mechanical turn in sensibility, the condition of possibility of this age of the pharmacon constituted by the psycho technologies of psycho power, consumerism transforms everything into needs, right? Right? Okay. That is into subsistence and liquidates desire. That is, objects of otium and sublimation, including for the highest levels of the bourgeoisie, who thus become a mafia. And as for the rage earners of the ideal, as Milner calls university professors, they too are unable to escape this fate. Now, the libidinal and political economies of contribution that are reconstituted in associated milieus tend towards the reopening of this dimension, right? So, um, yeah, Matt, you can admit uh, Raymond Schmidt and uh, the other people, or, yeah, sorry, I guess I could, yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, only otium of the people can reconstitute credit. That is an economy. There is no economy other than when it is projected into an investment. This reopens for the contemporary retentional system the question of protention, because an economy, whether it's libidinal or political, it is always an economy of protection. So what he's really trying to do here is get away, I think, from this notion of investment is no longer investment, yeah, is no longer investment, but it is um, speculation, right? He's trying to distinguish here between speculative short-termism, you know, an economy of carelessness, an economy of neglect, right, versus that, of an economy of investment in an associated milieu, which has the possibility of reconstituting society based on a kind of re-enchantment of the world. So you know, yeah. this is the ideal. So please go ahead, now, Richard. Yeah, yeah. No, philia. I just say, yeah, uh, uh, an economy of philia, of of, of amitié. Yes, of, yes. Of, right. Exactly. Yeah, an economy of philia, which means yes, both friendship, love together, you know, filiation, if you will, you know? I mean, association is a good enough word. You know, when Edward Said, for example, wrote The World, the Text, and the Critic, he spoke about, he talked about the Josiah Rice, so did Sam Weber, about the community of interpreters, right, in a way. And what would be established at that level was this kind of culture of filiation, very philosophical in that way, where that spirit was always alive. This was actually Nietzsche's dream of a radical aristocracy. 
as well in some ways. You know, Nietzsche was against the, the you know, the French Revolution. I mean, you know, most people think Nietzsche has a lot of preference to the left. This is this is total, uh, you know, bullshit because he's really thinking through right a new aristocracy of the spirit of the esprit in the in the French sense, both of the wit, the spirit, the geist, many things. This community. So this was a very different moment here. Whether Stiegler, I don't think Stiegler has that in mind because he he thinks that the Enlightenment project, which Nietzsche in some ways was highly against, in many ways, right? Highly against, and this is where the ambivalence of a Horkheimer and the Dorna comes in towards the, in the dialectic of Enlightenment. I think that this, this Enlightenment for, for Stiegler is something we need to go back to. We need to, we need to you know, return to it for, for Stiegler's purposes. This is what he's talking about, this maturity that he speaks to. Yep, this maturation process. You know, he really believes in the notion of trans individuation. It's no longer the Kantian language of autonomy or the ego sphere that could be autonomous in some ways or, or whatever. He's not really gearing for that. He understands relative autonomy during this epoch of hyper uh, industrialization. There's no such thing as, as full autonomy as, as a Habermas would have. You know, Habermas was very much into Kohlberg, the psychoanalyst. And psychoanalysis was the moral psychology of the ego, right? Stiegler's not, not on that wavelength at all. Yeah, not really thinking that through, which, which Habermas really took up as the unfinished project of the Enlightenment. So we have these, these kind of battle lines established between Habermas, you know, Stiegler, you know, of course, uh, you know, a lot of the structural Marxists too, as well. Um, you know, the, the uh, Balibars and Rossiers and the various ways that they went. You know, Stiegler is, again, he's really trying to think beyond, if you will, both with and beyond Marx. Um, and uh, I think this is important to keep in mind. You know, this in a way is a, the, the pretext is obviously Marx, the Marx of capital, the Marx of the, Marx of the Grundrisse, not so much the marks of the early manuscripts, but you know certainly the, the later marks. And, and you know he'll use this language. He'll use the language of circuits of capital. He'll talk about short circuiting too, which is another strategy of his prescription. You know one must search short circuit this cynicism and this disenchantment that is so consistent in everyday life. Yeah, yeah. So you know, and you know, in the age of the virus. You know, if you will, or what you know, some of us are calling the virus scene now. You know, alongside outside the Anthropocene and whatever, we're in this kind of the virus scene. Uh, is 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 a very different moment, I think, for you know us to, to to think. And will we be reduced to cynicism, to a new kind of impotence? You know, where is the enchantment? Where is the reconstitution to happen here? Again, this book is dated. I mean, I want to say this, this is an intervention of 10 years ago, <clears throat> still very relevant because yeah. we have not exceeded this phase of capital. You know, I, you know, this phase of the derivative that I that I date I date personally around 1973 with the birth of the options exchange and you know betting on futures on equities, futures on mortgages, credit default swaps mm -hmm. coming to being in the the 80s and the early 90s. Blythe Masters starts writing out her equations in the 90s, right? And then we get the fallout from all of this 20 years later, you know, with a few ups and downs. So, you know, and who knows what the, this crisis is much different than the crisis of 2009, 10, or 8 through 10, if you will, if you want to look at that as the, from, um, uh, it was what, Bear Stearns first, then Lehman Brothers, the collapse, right? And then the, the pink picking up of the Obama, you know, clan with, uh, brought to you by Larry Summers, that genius from uh, Harvard, uh, you know, <laughs> economist, right? Yeah, and, you know, the same old folks are, you know, consistently in power, right? I mean, mm -hmm. those who created the disease, speaking of the pharmacon, are the ones that are going to give us yeah. the prescription, yeah? So, yeah, right. this is another interesting part, going back to tragedy and farce. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have categories to describe the John Bolton at this point, or this clown at Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, or you know, whatever, you know, where, where we're going. 
So any, any thoughts or questions about the reading in general? I just wanted to open it up. And Andrew, I got a section on the body to discuss too, you know, today. I think he, he engaged, not, not in a full sense, but there's something, you know, there today to, to engage. Yeah. So any, any thoughts about this so far? I mean, I see, John, you, you put a lot of stuff in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay. So anyway, you want to say something, Andrew? Yeah. Or, yeah. I, that, that section, you, that section you just read, uh, reminds me of the Sopranos. You know, the uh, the HBO, the Sopranos, as right. that kind of, you know, where the mafia um, takes over the bush, <laughs> replaces the bourgeoisie. But but I was also, you know, he talked about the work of Maurizio Lazzaro. Lazzarato, uh, yeah, Lazzarato, yeah, Lazzarato, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which which I thought was very interesting about, you know, he makes this distinction between work and labor. Right. And he says that, um, you know, and he took, take, talks about these intermittent workers, part-time workers in film. So it's cinema, so theater. So I was very interested. And, um, you know, how they're not, you know, there's this, distinction as far as I could understand it I uh, and I'm not sure I did understand it he was talking about how uh, you know neoliberal capitalism when it wants to pay uh, these particular workers unemployment kind of wants to draw this very hard distinction between work and uh, leisure but this is where he introduces, or one of the places where he, he talks about otium, yeah. that there's, you know, which, is, which to me is very interesting as someone who makes films. And of course, part of what you're doing to, to make a film is you're watching movies, which of course is, le is classic leisure, you know, right? And, you know, I, I, I always joke when I go with a friend to see a movie at three in the afternoon that I'm hard at work. Um, and so that, you know, um, um, and, and he's kind of valorizing that, you know, it's not that people are either not working or working or this, this line such as the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, state wished to define it, but really brought up this whole question of work, you know, which is as different from labor. And, and how do we get to a culture that uh, legitimates and acknowledges um, this, um, um, you know, uh, this third term almost uh, of, of otium, if I, if I understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. you... Well, the, I mean, I think one thing that he's very interested on is how this whole culture of uh, the freelancer is made possible by negative taxation. You know, he's looking right. to take the role in this. How, do, how is this finance, this, this the, the leisure industry itself, right? He's, he really, he looks at this in a very good way. And as you know, uh, probably better than anybody here, is that, you know, without this kind of uh, tax write-off and negative taxation, you don't have a half, a half, one half of the cultural production out there, right? You need people but just, to need it. You want to open a bookstore, you go to someone that needs to lose a quarter of a million dollars a year, you know, <laughs> right? At least. Right? So, yeah. Same thing with films. You need a tax write. And this, this goes back to the oil and gas depletion during the 90% uh, tax rates back in the Eisenhower years. Everybody praises this 90%. Oh, look at this as a model. These idiotic Congress people, they don't understand this is when the culture of the loophole and you know, it was really created where negative taxation was really created. So there were people in the 50s that made millions of dollars that paid no taxes at all because it was going into oil and gas projects, right? And they had the depletion allowance that would allow them to write off, you know, so much money on their, you know, personal income tax forms and channel it through other means. So I mean, I think again, you know, the problem in 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 in, in some of this thinking is we look at forms, but we don't look at also the finance or the political economy behind the forms, you know, and this is what I think he's pretty good at to try to understand. Yeah. 
So, yeah. yeah. But you're right. I mean, he puts up this thing about the otium is lost, right? The know-how, in a way, the ability to right. really make is no longer there, right? In, in, in mm. a sense, right? Uh, right. It forces them into a kind of behavior right. which actually negates their ability to, you could say, make films as people who know films. You know, they become merely uh, operators, you know, operators of machines without camera operators, but without, and they have to s sacrifice, um, they're led to sacrifice the savoir faire in a very expanded sense of what that means right. um, by this, by this uh, structure, the structure that, that pushes them into a certain kind of subjectivity, you could say. Um, right. I mean, do, do most people agree that we're seeing this disappearance of the bourgeoisie as a class? Is that, is that something very real to everybody? I mean, or is he just kind of uh, playing uh, the academic <laughs> uh, prophecy here at, at, at work? I mean, I mean, you know, because he's really looking at new social classes. It's a re redefinition of class that's going on here. Really oh, I think, oh, yeah. I think it's true. You know, yeah. just my yeah. um, between generations. You know, um, I see so many people who, uh, you know, a generation ago, their their uh, parents were, um, you know, middle class and had a certain uh, liberty. Let's say liberty in terms of choices of of. Of, of leisure time, of of being able to go to the opera or go to uh, you know uh, that their their children now are uh, you know um, under the gun. You know they just they're uh, pushed they're up against the wall constantly just to uh, survive. I don't know if other people have that experience between generations, but. I think what Stiegler doesn't really speak to is, in a, in a detailed way, certainly hints at it, and it's all over the work underneath the surface, but is he doesn't really ex extrapolate or describe, you know, what capitalism has really managed to do now, steal everybody's time. That's really what it is. What you're speaking to is our parents' generation, and then the parents of the new generation, too, you know, have have basically, you know, the, the previous generation, probably up until the 70s or 80s at least, have, were able to have time to reflect, to enjoy, to be able to take, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and to be able to separate work from leisure as well. And he also speaks right. about the economy of work never ends, right? <laughs> There's a difference between the economy of work never ends, but the economy of the employer ends, right, at a certain level, right? The employment contract has the finitude, but the economy of work, that you continue to work all the time, and this is part of the proletarianization of the world, you continue to work almost in an infinite way. You know, you're always sleeping with the work, you're taking it with you everywhere. You know, what the internet obviously has done, it's made us, you know, on a 24-7, you know, you know, clock, so to speak. You didn't get my message, you know, at six o'clock, you know, or whatever. Money. We're making money for Google, you know, I mean, yeah. constantly. You know, we're, we're data. Our garbage is their gold, you know. Right. I mean, the fact, you know, I look at a T-shirt for sale, you know, for them as a data point, you know, what I do with my, that, you know, as I use my iPhone and my, uh, you know, my Facebook or my, uh, my Google, I'm not constantly... Um, I mean, this is why uh, Varoufakis, I, I don't know, Varoufakis is maybe not a good name to bring up here, though. I, I, I it's find okay, we like, like him. I mean, we like him personally. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it says that... I mean, I know we're the uh, architects of the lifelong learning camps, but, you know, uh, he's okay, you know. He <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, that these... Uh, Again, in our leisure, we're create, we're working for uh, um, these large uh, corporate monopolies. Uh, mm -hmm. In some cases, worldwide uh, monopolies. Right. 
Yeah. So anyway, uh, I mean, I was wondering from your, your point of view, uh, you know, or, or your reading, anything that really struck you in this, uh, this reading? I, I don't find that this is a very clear, I think, explication of what he's really trying to do in terms of a new critique. You know, he's saying the task of the philosopher here is to, is to bring a new critique, right? That Marx did not have it enough, right, in the 1858-59 critique of political economy, that he, he really wants to talk about uh, the, um, the, uh, the, new, new, the need for the new, um, new political economy that really looks at the consumerist model and overcomes it, that the model itself is, 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 um, has uh, run its course. So, I mean, in, in some ways, I think this is very important, and also the concept of tertiary uh, retention, you know, that we've talked about, which he defines uh, throughout this work uh, as well, you know, and the processes of grammatization, and which he does not think Marx had enough, you know, um, and Engels during their time, they just didn't have the tools to, to, to articulate this, and it, it came out in our, in our time. So, Anyway, um, I think this is um, this is very uh, important to, to, to understand. Um, um, uh, and, he, and he actually wants to give the, the meaning, a new meaning to the word critique again. He wants to go back in terms of critique, not only being a critical force, but also the ability to separate out. You know, krinon in, in Greek, you know, in the, is really to separate out, to be able to really look at what needs to be separated out at this point. So he wants to redefine that notion as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, again, and the libidinal energy, you know, where we, where we started here. So, I mean, any, I mean, really any thoughts, any thoughts from you? Um, uh, uh, I, I really think that this is really important. The work time outside of employment is something that we don't consider. We don't really look at this temporally, how techniques, and this epoch of hyper-industrialization has made us work outside of employment, right? Again, what our parents, certainly my parents, you know, the day ended, right? <laughs> you yeah. finished work, you ate dinner together, you know, you had, a, you had some kind of community, you know, et cetera. Today, no, I got work to do, I got to leave, I got to grab a sandwich, I got to grab a dinner, I need takeout, I'm going to be at home. You know, all these things are all constituted by by this uh, new new temporality and this new political economy based on the consumerist models. So I think this is very very uh, very important. Uh, yeah. So any 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 thoughts about this and, and any anything else in this uh, this reading? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say yeah, in please. relation to. But something that you, you mentioned last week, the Veblen, the theory of the leisure class. Yes. One of, one of the things that I marked from the beginning of the 80s, okay. certainly here and probably in your country, was that wealth no longer had to acquire prestige through culture. You didn't have to launder money through culture anymore. Money itself became, you know, the, the valued thing. So you had a whole new class of mainly developers and finance capital people um, who didn't produce anything. They kind of took over companies and, and <laughs> appropriated right. their, their, mm -hmm. their assets and sold them off. But they became immensely wealthy and the wealth itself became the status. So you had, you know, a whole new, I think, class, I mean, this relates to your thing about the end of the bourgeoisie. These were not people who invested in culture. They simply made more money and became celebrities on the basis of their wealth. Um, and that, I think, starts happening in the 80s. And I think it's also around that period that children come to be incorporated into the market through consumption and learning consumption and what I called commoditories, um, you no longer had a system where, you know, kids had transitional objects. They had fashion objects that changed continuously. And kids are hooked in to this system of desire and disappointment um, from a very early age. 
and that also I think ties in with with mm -hmm. what Stiegler is is arguing. Very interesting that you bring up this kind of identification with the Kamada toys and mm -hmm. how this mm -hmm. happens and and the objects. He he Stiegler himself is a is a very uh, uh, strong advocate of Winnicott's transitional yeah. objects. Yeah. psychoanalytically and he mm. sees the lack of this again mm. he's actually proposing the transitional object mm. as a necessary psychological yep. you know moment in order to get back to this reconstituted yep. uh, activity so that's a very yep. yeah very good very good point here yeah that the, somehow i mean i don't know if you remember the kid with the with the, the phone and he's playing with the e-trade the baby yes. in the crib, yes, yes, yes. you know, yeah. and, and the mom comes in and put that yeah. phone away, go to the yeah. sleep, and then the kid kind of sneaks it underneath and, you know, yeah. does this trading, you know, so yes. this is what the conditioning is about yeah. in a very yeah. early, uh, you know, the same. Mm. this is the thing of the 90s and, mm. you know, and the turn of the century. And I think you're yeah. absolutely right. When you look at Donald Trump, who's part of mm. this new wealth, that gives mm. nothing back to culture, gives no. nothing back to the society at all. Mm. It's just one shell company after another. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, Richard Brandon, you know, the Elon Musk, yeah. these kind yeah. of characters, Mark Cuban, you know, et cetera, this new yeah. wealth out there has nothing to do with culture at all. No. Gates, Gates and Eric Schmidt, another group of people, the same way. Mm. Whereas at least the Rockefellers, the Fords, yeah. the Carnegie's, et cetera, figured out foundations. You know, the biggest donor yeah. to the left forum, or one of the biggest donors, is the Rockefeller. Right. So, the left forum. So they, they're, yes. they're hedging yeah. their bets, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least they have that much then. But yeah. anyway, all to say, you're absolutely right. And this mm. was a, a great moment, you know, that most of the, you know, the um, uh, Jewish investment banking houses were founded by Jewish families who came up from the South. The Lehmans yeah. were from Alabama. Lazar mm. Frere, the Lazare brothers were from Louisiana. Mm. You know, they jumped ship there, you know, et cetera. And all of these, these people, they did not become speculators per se. They were investment long-term mm. bankers. I'm not, I'm not yeah. justifying them. They're not <laughs> no. my heroes, but at least they understood, you know, uh, you, you know, I know we had a thing about from Mao to Mozart and in the mm. chat room here, and we have some great comments. But but anyway, uh, all to say, um, yes, you're right. I mean, this investment in culture is mm. not there, which yeah. may also speak to this lack of an avant-garde. Yeah. The culture no longer becomes part of the everyday, you know, uh, life. In, 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 mm. anyway. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, just to, sorry. Hi, uh, Lydia. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I. I. Um. I had a thought about about this. Um. About this from page, in my copy, it's page sixteen about commerce and conversation. Yes. Uh, and he makes this point that a commerce is an exchange of savoir faire with savoir vivre, and so mm. to do and to live are coming yes. together in the marketplace. Yes. And I appreciated that because I love shopping and I'm, you know, an anti-capitalist. So, uh, and I believe consumerism is making us all drown in regression. So how do I manage my love of shopping as an expression of, you know, social interaction in these times when, when we're in, in isolated circumstances and beautiful, seeing beautiful things makes me feel great and talking to strangers mm -hmm. is a, a rare exquisite chance uh and i i bring to my sense of shopping a sense that i i'm looking for something virtuous to connect something mm -hmm. that that integrates or reflects um something artistic narcissistic um in the in the collection of the things of my life and so this idea of conversation and marketplace i i need a vision i need something to aim for outside of consumerism or beyond um mere uh mere exchange uh, and so this conversation idea is helping me mm -hmm. yeah josh you wanted to say something i mean uh um, 
my my comment was really about um, the change in the, the class uh, that sort of um, patronizes art, I guess, to go back to that for a second. Um, and in my own experience, it was it was it was less so that um, that uh, you know the Rockefellers or or whomever sort of were investing in culture. Though I agree that there was a shift there, uh, was but rather that the the whole art market became so speculative um, sure. on a very on a on a different level. Uh, it was no longer that art was invested in you know people's careers over long periods of time, but it was was sort of a pump and dump kind mm. of inflate the price mm. of, uh, mm. of a young artist get rid of the mm. uh the artwork and in, and in a sense like uh it led to a, a decoupling of the value of art from its market value yeah uh, at the same time so uh so there there is now like you know even in the midst of this depression or whatever you know there's there are some artists that are still uh, being bought, uh, you know, that I, that I work for or produce artwork for, uh, better than ever. And in some sense, and in a way it's, uh, it's because, um, you know, the institutions, the, the class of collectors, the whatever that had ordinarily, um, been in control of, of constituting value or valor valorizing people's artwork has sort of completely disappeared. Uh, as a result of the speculation that happened, um, you know, you know, and it still continues to happen, but was really, you know, from from the 2000s onward. I mean, this also is kind of congruent with art art fairs and yeah. and other kinds of shifts in the in the way that art was marketed. Yeah. Um, and and now is sort of in, encouraged something different with uh, with you know the prevalence of Instagram and other other ways to sort of mm. sell your artwork online. Um, Although that's limited uh, in the in the sort of professionalized art sphere, <laughs> but it also lets in people like cause like some street art, yeah. uh, other other sort of voices that were somewhat marginal or kept out of the, you know what constituted art that have now been admissible and has also led to sort of a destabilization of what value in art was. Too. So I mean, yeah, that was just my my sense yeah. of the the shift in the in the kinds of you know, way art has been commodified uh, to our present time. Or so. To second <laughs> what Josh was saying, I, I was writing for Art Forum back in the 90s and doing uh, performance art. And, you know, there were small galleries. Uh, I was connected with two of them. Uh, one run by Colin Delan, uh, American Fine Arts, and one run by Pat Hearn. And, you know, there were just all these gradations of, of levels of art that have just disappeared uh, yeah. and you know, basically bifurcated into, uh, you know, most, most who are, you know, uh, struggling, struggling to make, you know, the most minimal amount from their work and then the stratosphere of superstars. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in terms of the economy of films, it's been, it's kind of similar, you know. Uh, there are now, uh, you know, there, there used to be the, the film uh, under five, under five million, uh, you know, was kind of a, an ideal budget for a, a big, uh, uh, low, uh, low budget film. That's completely disappeared. Films now are usually either over 10 and usually way over 10 or under one and usually way under one um and uh you know sundance created a special category for films under a hundred thousand dollars and i know you know a lot of production designers who would like to kill sundance for that alone because of course uh you know of course producers they say well i can't pay you anything because we you know we've got to make it you know, we've got to make it for a hundred thousand dollars to fall into this category. Um, so, the, the problem to me is that Touch of Evil, for example, was made well under a million dollars. Las Alvidados of Buñuel was made for three hundred thousand. In fact, he came so far under budget they thought he was crazy. What you didn't make, you know, you didn't spend all the money. They told Louis Buñuel. The problem. 
problem is, is where's the value really being produced here in a sense? Because as you know, Richard, the $10 million film really doesn't have much value culturally. Yeah. You know, that uh, Jean-Pierre Melville's uh, very low budget Silence of the Sea is an impossibility for 90% of the film directors, script writers uh, today. You know, because everything has become, again, part of the automatic society, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, this loss of the transitional object, if you want to put it into psychoanalytic terms, right, in, in a sense. It's almost identification with the formula. You know, this is kind of, I think, maybe what Lydia was also talking about, you know, this, this in commerce, you know, you go out to shop. And what happens? What are you identifying with? You know, uh, you know where is that, that separation, that spacing? that is needed anymore. And it seems to me that, that that has been indoctrinated in the schools, but Josh can speak to this with the art schools, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, and, and other, other places out the schools have become these training grounds for this kind of thinking. It's, not, it's no longer about developing critical thinking or the total, you know, intellectual or whatever, or, uh, but it's right. really about, you know, this kind of formulaic textbook kind of attempt. You know, going forward, and I think this is what he means also about disenchantment, and you know how easy it is to get the cynicism from this consumerist model. Education is a consumer model; it has nothing to do with education. It's all about consumerism. Yeah, yeah. At this point. So I don't know. Yeah. So. Um, it, it, it reminds again the Otium. You know, I mean. Right. Um, you know, I remember I went to an interview. Sounds like a good name for a new film theater. <laughs> Instead of the odium, we're going to have the Paris, the we're have the odium, the odium, I can see this. <laughs> I was shocked. I, I went to a, uh, at the uh, DGA, the Directors Guild of America, I went to a screening by Michael Hanke, and I thought I was going to see, I thought, this is great, you know, we're going to see a, a film by Michael Hanke, and then we're going to, we're going to be talking, you know, we're going to be well, you know what, and, and lo and behold, all the directors sit there and they have this television interview question. There's no discussion at all. We're just literally the audience. Right. I mean, it, it, I was shocked that this is, the, this is how, you know, passive and, and uh, completely sheep led by, you know, what are so-called directors um, right so I, I'm, I, I'm yeah can you hear me yeah yeah okay good okay yeah I mean I, I would just like to go to a couple of other passages um, um, I would like maybe to also talk about the body but first of all um, I, I emphasize again I, I think it's really crucial to understand proletarianization and his encounter with Marx is really on pages, uh, beginning really on page uh, 30, um, um, uh, 30, uh, 30, 32. Um, and I, I just want to read for this for a second. He quotes from Annie Oedipus a long thing about organology. And this is, you know, the body without organs is basically Deleuze and, and Guattari's notion of Reich's organ energy, you know, Wilhelm Reich's uh, stuff. But anyway, it goes on. Now with the Industrial Revolution at the bottom of page 32, the process of dramatization constituting the history of mnemotechnics suddenly surpasses the sphere of language. That is also the sphere of Globos, with which it was placed by Deleuze and Guattari in an essential and original relation. The process of dramatization invests bodies and in the first place it discretizes the gestures of producers with the aim of making possible their automatic reproduction while at the same moment there also appear those machines and apparatuses for reproducing the visible and the audible that ca caught the attention of walter benjamin machines and apparatuses which dramatize perception and through that the effective activity of the new of the uh, nervous system. This dramatization of gesture, which was the basis of what Marx described as proletarianization, 
that is the loss of know-how, of savoir-faire, is then pursued with the development of electronic and digital devices to the point that all forms of knowledge become grammatized via cognitive and cultural nemotechnologies. This will include the way in which linguistic knowledge becomes the technologies and industries of automated language processing, but it will also co include the savoir vivre, that is behavior in general, from user profiling to the grammatization of affects, all of which will lead towards the cognitive, you know what we're talking about, the cognitive and the cultural capitalism of the hyper-industrial service economies. So where we are, and again, he's one of the first, in my opinion, with Mackenzie Wark, with uh, Ursula Hughes, who does very good work on, uh, you know, work in the uh, in the digital age, to really speak about this service economy this way, in terms of cultural, uh, cognitive and cultural capitalism, and the grammatization of that fact. So grammatization. So yeah, please. Yeah, what were you going to say? This is kind of like Taylor Taylorism. I mean, it, it's a new it, kind of Taylorism. Yes. Yeah. Kind yeah. of Taylorism. Although there's no punch out clock, work is always right. in excess of the employment. That's the interesting part about our epoch that capital has gone way beyond Frederick Taylor in terms of you know the worker discipline. The discipline is, doesn't even need it anymore, you know, in terms of the exterior boss, so to speak. We become kind of I, I, to work outside of the employer, right? We're, we're doing, the, yeah, please go ahead, yeah. I, I watched in uh, Misery, uh, Symbolic Misery, he talks about a film by Alain Rene, which you can find for free on YouTube, right. called uh, Same Old Song, right. which, uh, which was, I, th I found very much more interesting from his analysis than I probably would have otherwise, where these people are kind of living their lives and every once in a while they kind of break into these old songs, right. but you know, I think he's saying there's a Taylorism of our leisure time. You know, there's a kind of of way in which we're structured through these um, the, these um, these uh, kind of popular culture uh, ways of experiencing things that then come back to us. Uh, it, it was it was it was a great it was a great way to. Uh, think about some of his ideas was to watch this right. Alain Rene. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the reference he's making is pages 27 and 37 in uh, Symbolic Misery. Yeah. Page, page yeah. 27 and 30. If you're a fan of Alain Rene, uh, a truly great filmmaker, of course, uh, you know, uh, the already there, structurally outdated, right? The, uh, uh, you know, the uh, ill being, uh, durability, all about song. It's really an analysis of song, you know, how to song. Can yeah. you say that it, when he's talking about grammatization and a kind of extension of Taylorism, that this yes. is kind of, the, uh, do you think I'm right in bringing this, connecting it to the Alain Rene and what he's yeah, saying? Yeah, sure. Here about, I mean, yeah, you know, it's a very good, uh, very good point here. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Michael? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's a quick question. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about this disappearance of the bourgeoisie, and I'm just wondering. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not happening fast enough. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> is there, right. uh, in, in terms of the formation of new classes, is, is it sounds like from all the readings, this is sort of in formation, you know, trying to identify what would the new class be. But is there a void? where the disappearance of the bourgeoisie um, occurs? Or is there a new class or new classes arising simultaneously? Well, he'll talk about new uh, social class in general. He doesn't really talk about or give the new name, but he does talk about processes and the processes in the formation of the new class would be, or the new social class uh, to come is deproletarianization and decarbonification, right? He's really looking at these two levels that we really need. And so the disindividuated one, right, is really the new agent, if you will, right? 
the, the schizoid was the agent, the revolutionary agent in the anti-Oedipus. And of course, you know, uh, you know, so this is, again, even though he doesn't say it, he's looking for agency here. I mean, he doesn't say it, but he's obviously, I mean, you know, he's not that explicit, but I mean, you know, I know what he's up to. I mean, well, yeah. well it's, it seems yeah. that, yeah. it seems that the disappearance of the bourgeoisie and their, at least potentially, you know, there maybe isn't, you know, a, a, a co-arising a co of, of, of a new class. Maybe the void there is, uh, is potentially the revolutionary possibility. You know, it's, it's, well, certainly the, the revolutionary mass, you know, you can think of it that way, right? I think what he's trying to guard against, and he does this in his work on hyper-industrialism in uh, disbelief and, and, and discredit, right? And this is another, you know, outside his ontology, he's doing this kind of descriptive, hyper-analytical, critical work of industrial democracies, right? And the decadence of industrial societies. What he's really trying to guard against is industrial populism, both right and right. So this is the guarding he's doing at the same time that you have this disappearance of the bourgeoisie. No longer can the world be, be divide, divided into capital and labor, right, only, you know, or worker and boss, or, you know, labor power only too. I mean, he's really looking at that term. What does labor power really mean to us today? So the new vocabulary is, is trying to, you know, develop this through, um, you know, an analysis of what you call the void of the mass, this new emergent, if you will, social class. We don't know what it's going to look like. Well, it seems like the, where the agency is. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm it's sorry. Yeah. It's all right. It's, it seems like the deep de proletarianization process is yes. what is it if it's not a revolutionary process or the coming agree, into a transformation? Yeah. And I want to say, just in response to some things that were said earlier about the problem of the arts, um, I, I want to say that my experience in both dance and painting is that this kind of quarantining is the word that's up, you know, like the, the, the lack of resource itself it feels to me like revolutionary potential you know i cannot work in the old forms and the old <laughs> in the way the old forms or even the way the old avant-garde's worked you know th there's there isn't the access to capital so there has to be a kind of transformation of the way art is thought and the way art becomes an object in the world you know uh outside of almost capitalist relations you know the, 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 and that's i think where the potential lies and it's you know that's another aspect to me of the deep proletarianization process you know it's like we have to think in completely new terms because we don't have the resources and and and, and not yeah. having not having the resources is not an excuse to not make one still has to make and and then the question of you know what is made and the relevance of what is made is determined by, I, I want to say this, the way I'm thinking about it, this deep proletarianization process. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the value of what's made? Yeah, I, I the second what Andrew is saying is, um, you know, there's obviously there are all these people with their cell phones taking video clips. And, you know, some of them are quite, you know, like, you know, the, the ones that set off Black Lives Matter um, have incredible impacts. And, you know, there's a way in which there's a kind of filmmaking which empowers or legitimates, you know, you could, there, there are two kinds of filmmaking these days. There's one that's kind of like shock and awe. You go, oh my God, how did they ever do that? And, you know, oh my, it's, oh, wow. And then there's a kind of filmmaking, which is, you know, you think, well, it's better than what I could do on my cell phone, but it's not, it's not beyond, in other words, it's thought out, it's, it's, it's intellectually, there's an integrity there, but it, it empowers, it, it says something about, you know, just the fact that we've all become much more literate about filmmaking by, 
having these cell phones that can let us edit and such. There's a literacy about the, the image, the moving image, that didn't exist 20 years ago. And good, it's true, you know, as Godard said, uh, uh, many love film, film loves very few. It's, it's, there's still a matter of talent and all of that, but still it's very, it's very interesting about a kind of work that says um, to the audience that there's a, you know, there's a continuity between what they do and what, uh, what the professional quote unquote, or the person is really devoted to it, who takes it as a vocation does. And then work that, again, is more Hollywood based, which is what I call a shock and awe, where you're just like, oh my God, how could they ever do that? Yeah. Richard, do you have any unofficial videos that you have uh, enjoyed taking? Are you yourself yeah. getting moved by the availability <laughs> of your but hi, uh, yeah, in part two. Huh? <laughs> You're sounding very impassioned, and I yes, I'm he does. yes, yeah. <laughs> Yes, well, I'm, I'm actually in the process of moving uh, some of my feature films to a, uh, a, a certain state, you know, setting up a, a Vimeo station for them. I've had them elsewhere. Um, and then, I, no, then I have some short films, everything from my daughter, uh, you know, reading The Odyssey and talking to her about reading The Odyssey to uh, United Against Racism and Fascism. I did, you know, a little thing for them. All, co I mean, oh my gosh, or, you know, my father in a, in a pancake eating contest. I, I'll, uh, I'll send, I'll, I'll send a link or something. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. Thank you for yeah. asking. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for helping me make a plug for my work. Yeah. yeah, I just want to respond to something that's going on in the chat which I think is very relevant, what John has put in there about a commodification of the G. Floyd video. I mean, if you really look at this from the, the, the standpoint, if you will, or look at it through the perspective of media, et cetera, I mean, who's really value, valorizing this moment, right, in a sense? Yes, of course, the principle is on the street, but the value itself, you know, the, the exchange value is going on in the media. It's in the image. It's the society of the spectacle once again that's really occurring. So I, I think this is something we always have to take into account. Going back to this notion of the of the mass, right? The revolutionary agents, etc. You know, what does this really mean relationally to a very omnipresent, right, and almost you know completely dominant media as time mm -hmm. goes on, right? Who, who continually to shape. And you know, uh, uh, you know, muster and and uh, you know promote opinion, and very good at doing so. You know, I mean, you have to look principle of selection, time allotted, certain repetitions of key verbs. You know how images play out. All of these things. I'm not saying they're fully conscious, but they are fairly conscious of the way this is done in terms of the daily can. You know, uh, um, you know, uh, um, a moment of the reception. So this is something that, I mean, I think Spiegler is really aware of the cognitive and the affective and the production of the images, right? Mm -hmm. And how does one confront that as, as well, you know? Because this is very, very, uh, very, very important to, 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 to keep in mind, right? I mean, we're living through a theater of hysteria and panic right now, too. Everybody's yeah. on edge, right? And the, and the philosophical categories, going back to, again, what Andrew mentioned uh, about this Void. The abyssal plain is not really being examined, right, <laughs> in terms of its entirety. You know, where are we on the abyss right now? Where are we? Where are we standing, so to speak? <laughs> you know, I know Saul Bellow used to say about Heidegger, "Where were we standing when we fell from the into this abyss?" You know, he he wrote this in the novel Herzog. I'm not a big fan of Saul Bellow, but I, I thought that was one of his funnier moments. But but anyway, all to say, I mean, you know, we're living in this very very commodified image world. You know, DeBoer is sort of somewhat out of date. You know, we've advanced further than him, and Stiegler is certainly a, um, is a moment of that. But where, 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 where are we, you know, relationally to the principles of the street, the values of the street, and then how this is commodified as image, et cetera, 
right? This is very important, I think, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to me. And I don't know if you remember uh, the, the Sidney Lumet, Lumet film Network uh, back in the late 70s, but mm -hmm. very interesting the way the, the radicals were basically commodified by the media. You have the mm -hmm. Mao Zedong uh, hour, mm -hmm. right? If you remember yeah. this film. Very, very clever, Patty Chavesky's uh, attempt mm -hmm. to look at this. Uh, you know, a, a great script writer and Lumet had the right combinations. You know, William Holden, Faye Dunaway. Um, uh, who played Albert Beale? He, he died early. Um, oh, God. I forgot. But anyway, you know, everybody's mad as hell still, right? <laughs> everybody's raising up the window. That's where, mm -hmm. where we are, in a sense, mm -hmm. 40 years later. You know, in this film, no accident, it came out two years before the, the so-called Reagan-Thatcher Reagan revolution. There is the, the Tina syndrome. So again, I, I think he's working with these syndromes, but very well aware of the mathematization of the image, right? How many times is it repeated? When does it come on? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a filmmaker, so I don't know all the you know little techniques that are used. But you certainly can pick up on the patterns, the gestalts that are going on in the dominant media, in a way. And is the alternative media enough to to confront this? That's another thing we'd have to ask: Is the cell phone culture right? How is that used and then commodified? You know, uh, in terms of the new viral uh, uh, moment. So I think these are very real, real questions, you know, um, um, you know, uh, uh, moving, moving forward. But I, I like the fact that, you know, we're talking about the abyss, the, the formation of maybe a new critical mass, and that this is where the equation of the agency is in these new social classes, in these new social movements. It's no longer about struggle between, you know, uh, bourgeoisie, you know, and, and, and proletariat. You know, he's... He, he understands this, I think, very well. Yeah, in a way, we've shifted, you know, in this sense, and this is why I think his uh, his equations are good. So he he part of his prescription, if you will, or the beginning of an alternative, is to try to short circuit this. You know, this is what he means by economy, and maybe Andrew can speak to this of artists using other means, an economy of contrib contribution, the economies of care, associated milieus. These are the kind of terms he uses. I'm not saying this is the only thing out there, by all means, not, not at all. But, but, you know, how would one act, actually use this moment, you know, uh, you know, after the Stieglerian, to, to get, to, to reconstitute, again, I use this phenomenological term because he, he uses it all the time. How do you reconstitute pro-tension, an economy of pro-tensions into the future, right? You know, when you know what tertiary retention is. For him, uh, you know, tertiary retention is really what we're dealing with. This is what precedes and what the child is born into. This is his notion. It's not, it's not just, uh, you know, all the sense channels are open. No, the child is, is thrown, if you will, into natality is really a pro-tensional, retentional moment, right? <laughs> and and he, he's very well aware of this uh, in terms of the creation of new generations. So, I mean, you know, I think these are very good questions here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a visual culture is going to produce two things. Number okay. one, oral regression, and number two, paranoia in the visual field, anxiety about invaders. And so I think that's exactly our situation. So the invaders are the Chinese? Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering where the war machine is right now. Yeah, because that's where it looks like it's going. You know that that's the new the the, the new invaders are anything at your peripheral vision. So okay, okay I see. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a visual culture means you are uh, orally fixated on on love in the gaze and the face, right. and also uh, attend uh, then attend attending to what you can't quite see. So anxiety at the edge of vision. Um, and um, paranoia that comes from that. I'm now just looking around my space and trying to feel anxiety in it and uh, imagining uh, these big blockbuster films that are doing this, um, this narrative to us of escalating um, sounds and, and emotions and try, trying to put together uh, I guess a Hollywood version of this war machine that John is talking about 
um, in the chat and trying to put that together with shopping and cell phones in terms of our uh, oral regression at the screen. So the big screen does these uh, paranoid uh, peripheral vision activities and the little screen does the comfort in, in, the, in the consuming uh, uh, up close. I see, interesting. Hmm. But isn't China- is Interesting, it just... Lydia, is there a, something? Well, who's gonna speak? I'm sorry, Andrew or Richard or- Go, Well, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. All right, I, just quickly. Um, yeah. it, it almost seems though that China is a kind of, isn't that really just to distract us from what's going on in the streets? Like, I want to say that the real enemy is at home. I mean, the enemy is the quote proletariat, if we can even still use the word, you know, I mean, the enemy are, are the people that are in resistance, right? And isn't that, isn't that part of the deproletarianization process that, that, that people are, are come to consciousness and they actually take space and resist? Isn't that, isn't that the bigger enemy? Um, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know why there would be a, a big or little enemy. I mean, it seems like the, the thing with China is, is that, you know, you're beginning to hear the discourse. So you have to read this at, at multiple levels. Of course, at the State Department and at the intelligence agencies levels, there is a propaganda machine that is really operating at the level of preparing for, you know, uh, the image of China as enemy, you know? Maybe not Chinese Americans, right, in a, in a sense, but you know, you know how this works out, you know, sometimes in the, in the culture. And part of the reason for that is, of course, because that's where the manufacturing is. They're building all over the world. They have very good relations, you know, in most countries in terms of helping to build infrastructure. U.S. does not know how to use investment capital because it's all speculative capital going back to Stiegler. The Chinese are very aware state, I mean, if you want to call it this, state authoritarian, authoritarian capitalism, capitalism, which is or state capitalism, which yeah. China could be considered, is much more advanced than this, you know, uh, disappearance of the bourgeoisie in late capitalism in the American, and or at least in the Euro-American version of, of, of the way things are in some ways. So I think we have to think about this on multiple levels. I'm, I'm not really positive. Yes, of course, they're threatened somewhat from the streets, but the streets are not armed yet. The streets don't have the courts with them. You know, this is something we have to also think about, too. You know, how does this, how does this play out? Is that really an enemy to them, or is that part of the distraction for the massive mismanagement of where, where capital is now? Does Trump use this? as a way of just reinforcing his base and saying, you know, this is what we're going to show you on election day or something like that. I mean, you know, you, could this be a dress rehearsal? Could this be, again, yeah. part of the spectacle that's very real? So I, I think we need to be very careful and not just do it either or. There are many levels. Phil, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think he's trying to use it, but I think he's failing, honestly. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, the whole the whole idea of sending the uh, Homeland Security troops into Portland, Oregon, you know, to, just to raise hell is, I, I think, backfiring, frankly. Um, you, you know, because the people in the streets have, have been, you know, relatively uh, cognizant of the image that they're trying to project. You know, the wall of... Uh, the wall of moms being tear gassed every night is is not you know <laughs> is not going to work. Oh, is the apple pie. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, but I, I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the 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 the, the, the point again here is that we shouldn't run too quick to say you know the enemy is here you know and that's how they're constituting. I think this is operating on multiple levels mm -hmm. and it's, it's really a, a task of interpretation to see the layers right that are playing out and how they may feed each other i'm not saying we're going to figure it all out i'm not i'm not making a claim for that but i think that we need to think about this too in terms of what's going on 
in terms of globalization and new forms of globalization that the U.S. I mean, there's no Marshall Plan operative no. right now. There's no there's no uh, new frontier. There's no great society, right? Etc. You know, it's race to the bottom. As you know, to invert the Obama educational pride race to the top. It's really race to the bottom, and now a complete devolution with uh, DeVos and company. I, I guess you guys know how bad this really is. I mean, there's blackmail going on in terms of the way schools will run and whether sure. they own or not. I mean, outright blackmail, monetary blackmail, you know, that's happening at this point. Not that things don't work that way all the time, but it's overt always. You know, this is the, the thing, it's very overt. Whereas on the other hand, China, you know, is, is, is around the world, they're building, you know, a high-speed railroad to go to London. You know, think think about these things, what's going on in terms of investment capital, you know, for the future, based on a Stieglerian notion of technics and time. You know, who is going to control that technics and time? And I'm not saying, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe the Lazzarato, who Richard mentioned, you know, did put out there about 15 years ago, the most likely future is Chai America, you know, in a way, you know? I mean, it's no action. You know, Henry Paulson, you know, big Hank in the room during the financial crisis, taught two years in Beijing at the business school, <laughs> right? I mean, this is Goldman Sachs at work, you know? So we have to keep these things in mind, too, what, what is going on among, quote, unquote, you know, not bourgeoisie, right, <laughs> as a disappearing class, but ruling, ruling level, right, e et cetera. What, what is really happening at those levels? And you know, back to the scriptwriter, who is, who is, who is going to think? And, you know, we, we talk about Biden being better than Trump, but you think about Biden in terms of China. He's ready to, you know, go to war. I mean, you know, and you need Democrats to go to war. You think about this. Look at Clinton in, in Serbia. You know, I think, think about this. Vietnam. Who, who escalated in Vietnam? Eisenhower? No. He, he heard the French, right? Right? It was the end part of Kennedy, and then on the, you know, the, the Kennedy advisors to Johnson early on that did this, right? The same thing, you know, with, with the Clinton administration. Obama, who brought home, uh, you know, bin Laden and, and all this targeted assassinations. So I think this is, this is something we have to be in touch with. And, you know, Biden's great comment about the streets was, we shouldn't shoot to kill, you should shoot to maim. This is his notion on the police. Don't shoot to kill, shoot to maim. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And, and we're not ready for Medicare for all or for single payer health care mm. in the middle of a pandemic. So this is what we're getting, folks. I mean, I, I just see, you know, and I mean, I would like to see nothing better than what Andrew is talking about, this groundswell, you know, that really comes up and it is, you know, uh, directed and educated in the sense. My fear, once again, is that, is that the, the, um, the, um, Democratic Party will co-opt this as much as it possibly can. Mm. It's going to bring in these people like, uh, what's his name, Cuffey, that's on the media all the time from Black Lives Matter, and all these people that have connections to, you know, uh, representatives in the Democratic Party, and they're going to say, look, we're going to take care of you, give us a little time, we're going to win this and that in, in Congress, just wait till you see AOC go ballistic, you know, uh, you know when Biden gets elected. Anyway, this, this, this to me is, you know, that's part of the script, right? That <laughs> we might be in. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, but I, I, I actually think that they're, they're kind of losing control of the narrative, though. You know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a, I mean, it, it's one of the things that, you know, spread the, uh, George Floyd demonstrations to pretty much every corner of the country, um, you know, to small cities, large cities, whatever, is 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 the ubiquitousness of uh, of the images that were being uh, shared, you know. But you know, shared by just ordinary people for the most part, um, and, and I think that that there is, uh, you know, the there's a there's a desperate attempt to regain control of the narrative, narrative, but I, I don't, I really don't uh, have, uh, 
I don't think there is much talent in the Democratic Party. Uh, around, I mean, you know, they're trying to they're trying to ramp up Cold War 2.0, either with China or Russia. I mean, they they don't really they don't really care which, as long as one of them works. But it doesn't seem doesn't seem to be getting a hell of a lot of traction, except with perhaps a uh, certain paranoid uh, people my age. Um, you know, so it's. Uh, I'm uh, I'm 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 less uh, you know I'm I'm a little more optimistic, I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not really trying to be a pessimist. I'm just trying to be you know quote careful in terms of how we uh, how we proceed. I mean, you know, we we can look at you know Tahrir Square for example, right in in Egypt you know, where daily uh, doses, et cetera, the result was Mubarak, you know, and, and, and then post-Mubarak into, what's his name, uh, uh, Mors um, uh, Morsi, right? And, and Morsi, how, yeah. How did we get, yeah, how do we get, get to that, you know, in a sense, right? And, you know, law and order, I mean, some of us in this, uh, in this uh, you know, virtual session lived through a period of which, you know, we saw college students blown away by our own National Guard. Yeah. You know, we saw African-American students, very few, few people continue to talk about Jackson State, but Jackson State, mm -hmm. two black people, and there could have been many, many more, and, you know, um, um, et cetera. So we, we've seen this at many, many levels. We've seen, you know, instead of Breonna Taylor, we saw Fred Hampton out of nowhere at the middle of the night. They didn't go to the house, you know, in the middle of the evening. They went at three in the morning mm -hmm. to Fred Hampton's yeah. house in, in Chicago you know, et cetera. So it's not like a lot of this is new. I mean, you yeah. know, in some ways, in terms of the nemo techne, you know, or, or, you know, quote, tertiary retention. The question is, is it new now because, you know, capital has moved to the narrative of capital and its practices have made it impossible for any kind of mobility anymore, right? Except for those, right? Orchestrating finance capital where we kind of began this session you know, going back to, uh, you know, the 19, late 70s and early 80s, how this, this occurred, right? This, this kind of, you know, state of shock, this yeah. disaster capitalism, this, you know, notion there is no alternative and who it enriched and, and no longer was it the enrichment of, of a, a class of people that had some kind of feeling for culture, had some kind of feeling for like power was really more what it was about power of the of, of the enlightenment to a degree i mean i like these people who are readers of Kant, you know uh, uh henry ford the second or you know uh john d Ryan or nelson rockefeller etc we all know when what he did with prisoners etc but at least there was something about book culture you know i mean there's something about you know the culture in there and i think beryl's right i mean you know this is a group of people that are so nouveau riche you know, so much about conspicuous consumption that the, the 300 foot yacht in the Mediterranean or, or in the Pacific, on the, in, you know, uh, islands are much more important than whether the New York Public Library exists yeah. or that the Metropolitan Museum of Art or MoMA exists or whether, you know, some good films are made, right, et cetera. You know, you're not going to, yeah. so this, this, I think this is something we need to really keep in mind alongside this too. And, and where would this process go to? You know, the Germans also have a thing about it, and this is something that maybe a, a discussion should happen, maybe at the left forum, but, uh, uh, you know, do you retain monuments for historical purposes, for dialectical purposes? You know, <laughs> is it only one side of the story? Certainly, you know, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, these kind of monuments, and you can go down the list. But why wouldn't you just place this in a museum where you can actually talk about this? You know, how Aristotle was used to argue for the, by the slaveholders, right, in a sense. These are going to get much more of an education than cancel culture. I, I'm going to refer people to a very good uh, essay on Verso's, uh, Verso Books uh, uh, website by Saad Heider on cancel culture. And it's a reading of Spinoza on the mode of expression, on Spinoza's Tractatus. Um, political, uh, theological, politicus tractatus. Uh, a very interesting thing about how one reads 
and what the mode of expression is really about. So I, I think these are very real questions. I mean, I, I, I would like nothing better to see in my lifetime, you know, and, instead of with Lydia looking around her room paranoically, I'm rejoicing for joys because the streets have been taken. And, you know, the revolution, you know, is here and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this would be a, a moment of, you know, a, a great hallelujah, way beyond Leonard Cohen singing of it. But, but you know, on the other hand, you know, what, what are we really dealing with ultimately here? You know, I mean, we're dealing with a very infantilized public, too, yeah. and a very infantilized yeah. culture. What we haven't mentioned is that during this period of the 80s, 90s, 2000, et cetera, and what's being forced right now are people back into extremely dependent relationships with family, you know? Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, that this is now reinforcing itself at these levels too, that the, the prolonged dependency on the family, on the parents that is, has been created too, does not really make for great thinking, right? <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, in, in a sense, you know, the, the earlier the separation, the better. And, you know, this is something that was a product of the 60s. You had to get out of the house if you had any moxie. Not everybody did it, but, you know, I mean, at 17, 18 years old, you wanted your own apartment. Today, I mean, there are 35-year-olds living at home still because of economic reasoning, right? Or, you know, and emotional. So this this is something else that we should really thought, think about, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. But also, uh, yeah, please, yeah. In terms of uh, cancel culture, uh, I, first of all, I wanted to ask you the name of the uh, the writer of the article is Sad Hyder, H E I D E R. H A I D E R Assad, A S A D. He's uh, supposedly at the New School now. Yeah, was at Santa Cruz for a while. Um, yeah. But also, you know, uh, this was a reinterpretation that took place of uh, the use of Lacan in film theory of which Joan Kopchak was an instigator. But prior to uh, her intervention, you know, the idea for, for a huge part of film theory after the 60s was to take the uh, uh, Lacan's article on the mirror stage and to say, well, the screen is a mirror. Um, and uh, it, it uh, mirrors back, people then are mirrored into the image. And you know, this is a kind of uh, reductionism. And then Kopchak pointed out that no, actually, if you read uh, Lacan, you know, it's really about the objet petit a, and that rather than the screen being a mirror, the mirror is a screen. Uh, in other words, uh, there's a way in which one always interpolates oneself. There's something in the image that doesn't quite fit. Uh, it doesn't have a mirroring effect. Right. And, um, but this kind of reductionism means that, you know, um, it, to have statues of Confederate generals, which I, I'm happy to see come down, but still the idea that somehow it's a simplistic idea of, you know, the very presence of, of these figures are going to somehow implant us with uh, ideas I mean, even on the, you know, even on the, you know, you go back and read Horkheimer and Adorno talking about jazz in, uh, you know, in that Adorno, book. Adorno, Adorno primarily. Adorno. Horkheimer yeah. never really yeah. mentioned jazz, about, yeah. Although he looked yeah. like a jazz impresario. <laughs> he looked you like know, a all about, about, about movies, right. Right. you know, they're, they're so, it's so like, uh, uh, ridiculous. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. it it's like, well, there's, there's really no hope. It's all, and, and generally, they're true. You know, there's a, there's a large, you know, for the most part, yeah, that's true. But still, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, uh, since they wrote that article, there have been one or two good films. Yeah, maybe one or two. Um, I'm being, I'm being facetious. Yeah. Um, well. And and yeah, so there's a kind of very. Um, uh, phobic reaction towards, uh, you know, images. And there's this idea that somehow there's, you know, again, the fantasy of, a, of someone controlling, you know, in some, in some kind of, you know, that power is, is able to control how we interpret images. 
which again, I mean, it's it's not an idea to be dismissed. It's it's largely, uh, it's it's usually the case, but still there remains a margin of interpretation, uh, hermeneutics, uh, which you have to you have to uh, elevate within the masses or within you know the ability to think critically um, and to ask you know questions and not to be uh, just merely uh, taken in right yeah but it, well, that, it, yeah. That, that exists yeah uh, i mean I, I think the stiegler has a lot of the frankfurt school in him I mean, I think there's a very good book on this for anybody that you know, wants to take the time to do the extensive research. But I think that Stiegler, in some ways, is in an ongoing conversation on the culture industry apparatus, the dialectic of enlightenment in particular. And Stiegler, again, yeah. going back to jazz, the Adorno essay, at some levels, is also an essay about fashion, not only about jazz. Mm. You know, he'll speak about jazz, but at another layer of that essay, it is really about fashion and perennial fashions that take place in our culture and become this way. So I think this is very, very interesting that Adorno could see this. And again, Adorno never listened to Parker. He never listened mm -hmm. to Ornette Coleman. He never listened to anybody beyond Artie Shaw was probably as fast far as he got or Glenn Miller. You know, he was a champagne jazz. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to degrade these people. I love Steve Miller, Fly Like an Eagle, you know, and all this. His son, Mitch Miller's son, and Artie Shaw was, you know, he was hot and hot. But this wasn't the bird nor Ornette or Max Roach and these people that really had you know, chops, I mean, to put it mildly. You know, you talk about Mozart, Teddy Wilson, for example, Billy Holiday's a, a, a pianist was a member of the Communist Party, and he was known as the Marxist Mozart, Teddy <laughs> Wilson, one of the great, great, great pianists of his period, alongside Art Tatum. Anyway, I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but I, I hear you, yeah, in a sense, yeah, but yeah, yeah. But I mean, Stiegler is really continuing this kind of, you know, on the one hand, the dialectic is really progress, but progress is a word that we no longer have any kind of meaning to. Yeah. Right? This is really what, what, what's going on. The Enlightenment is a failed project. And Habermas's attempt to recapture the Enlightenment as a project, right? I mean, this is at the philosophical level, is really unduly, you know, impossible. You know, you, you can't do it, right, in a sense. So he's trying to look at this from the standpoint of the last, you know, 25 years, digital technologies. Mm -hmm. He's trying to take into account this new proletarianization, right, that has led to a generalized stupidity, infantilization, if we want to talk about it in terms of the psychic, right, a collective individuation that becomes more systemically stupid every day in terms of the short-termism and the thinking. Everybody's only thinking the election. Yeah. Nobody's thinking five years out. They're all thinking about getting rid of Trump. This is what, you know, this is the 90% of the, the conversations you go to. You know, no matter if you're on the left, the right, <laughs> you know, the middle, whatever your politics are, are usually about, you know, November, right, in, in a way. So we're, we're, we're even thinking like quarterly reports on Wall Street, you know, in a sense, this short-termism, right, and, you know, in a sense. And, and just think where we're going to be, because baseball now looks like it may started too early. They, they canceled two games tonight which is distressing to me because I, you know, I need that diversion for, a, a, you know, an awful summer in the sense that I couldn't get into Canada yet. But, but anyway, all to say, you know, here we are, sports, which is the glue that keeps this country together. Mm -hmm. Just think of a, a fall, you know, people yeah. not in school, us not in school and not having pro football to have yeah. that aggression on Saturday night football, Sunday all day, you know, the new church, and then on, on Monday night football, where you come back from work, right? And now Thursday night. So, you know, when, you know, the Thursdays, you know, worse, you know, you know, the storm, so stormy Monday. So, you know, in a way, this is stuff, stuff really worth thinking about that Stiegler is, is looking at in, 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 in his own, you know, in his way, the short termism that keeps us, you know, not only from thinking, but it makes us, you know, systemically stupid. Well, it's an you know, opportunity. We, we act, and we can articulate things. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Just yeah. going to say it's an opera. Yeah, without football, I mean, it's an opportunity to break the addiction. 
Well, he speaks of the addictogenic society, but I don't know if that addiction, that addiction is going to turn into, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of domestic violence. Yeah. A lot of stuff on the streets. This is going to be a problem, you know? Yeah. Well, we have, we now yeah. have a, a spike in homicides in uh, yeah. New York, uh, right. in right. New Day and other cities. Um, I don't know if anyone has any uh, theories they want to, if they want to speculate about the causes of that. Um, but certainly one would think that, um, you know, along these lines, you know, that there's uh, just this built up uh, explosive um, mm. short term, you know, we're talking about drives and, uh, uh, you know, just kind of like, I remember, I remember playing soccer in Paris with, um, you know, a whole, a whole international group. We were all playing soccer and uh, this Englishman turns to me and he goes, he goes, you know, this is a great way to get out your aggressions, but you Americans, you have an even better way. You go out and you shoot someone. <laughs> <laughs> or you throw a pigskin and you tackle each other at 30 miles an hour. You know the impact of a six foot four, 250 pound linebacker who can run the 40 yard dash I can't. 4.3? You're getting hit by a moving vehicle at 22 miles an hour. Uh, I to point that that is the impact of what these running backs and these uh, these uh, uh, wide receivers, tight ends experience. Right? So rit ritual theorists of violence are divided on this topic. Whether are they? okay, <laughs> whether whether a spectacles of violence actually remove uh, through a kind of empathy the desire for violence, or whether they right. but they encourage it. Yeah, encourage it. Encourage right. it. Thank so you. Domestic violence right. and the alcohol. Right. Use yeah. of course goes up uh, on football right. days right. already. So mm -hmm. is the deprivation of that worse? Yes, probably. But my God, it's it's confusing. I have <laughs> yeah. a question. It's, it's, I have a question yeah. about class struggle. Yes. Yeah. So on page forty, he says uh, he's yeah. relating all of this to the weakening of the theory of class struggle. Yes. which makes sense if the uh, the bourgeoisie are disappearing. But I, yes. I just want to hear some more about that. Yeah, sure. This is a very good section. Maybe I should read it out loud and I'll make a couple of comments. And yeah, very good that you brought this up. I wanted to go there. The proletariat right. is not the working class. Mm. So this is a proposition that he's really wor he works through all of his work post, uh, you know, techniques and time. Uh, through the ontology. Uh, onto What's the all, This is page 40. Yeah, page 40. Okay. Yeah. And then for a uh, new critique of political economy in the, in the handout for today. So the proletariat right. is not the working class. All of Marxism has misinterpreted Marx in confusing the two. I wouldn't say all of Marxism. Well, I, I understand that. But, you know, this, is how, this is how people write, Josh. <laughs> this is how people write. The okay. universal has thing. He makes a proposition and then he goes to the all, right? Okay, and confusing the two. Okay, a typical case can be found, for example, and speaking of an Althusserian, Jacques Rancière's The Knights of Labor. This is a beautiful book, by the way. Uh, the Worker's Dream in 19th Century France. But on the other hand, and above all, grammatization by allowing the harnessing of the attention of consumers, and through that, the harnessing of their libidinal energy made equally possible their proletarianization by destroying their savoir vivre, and not only their savoir faire. This proletarianization of consumers is what made it possible by opening up mass markets enabling resistance against the tangential fall of the rate of profit to confer buying power upon consumers, to accord them more than simply the renewal of their labor power, and to fundamentally and practically weaken the Marxist theory of class struggle. Okay, so what happens in the, from 1973 on? The working class, right, is, has had seen increasing wages, right? almost as good as, as real, real wages, not only nominal increases, but somewhat keeping up with inflation from post-World War II until 73. Then all of a sudden, everything becomes flattened. The working class wages 
become flat all the way until today, or even decline in terms of real right. wages. How, did, how is this created, this borrowing power? Well, I didn't have a credit card when I got out of you know undergraduate <laughs> school, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't have a credit card until I had to go get a, a stupid rent a car once upon a time. They wouldn't give me one on, on, on a cash basis. But anyway, credit. They created this credit system, right? During this period that has gone mm -hmm. to infinite heights, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what he's really saying here is that finance capital figured out a way, right? To keep people in debt, going back to Lazzarato, the, the, uh, the, he, he writes a very good book on indebted man, by the way, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, who was a student of Deleuze and uh, Guattari, who was in seminars, Italian Marxist from the Negre group, from the autonomy. So what, what happens is we become a culture of debtors, right, mm -hmm. in a sense. Nobody can keep us up. The house was to live in, not to become an asset, of where mm -hmm. you send your kids to college through. Mm -hmm. So think about this in a way, what he's really doing here in terms of updating us and why no longer this whole sense of, you know, the, the proletariat, right, is not really the working class, right? He is looking at this mm -hmm. through a new kind of class lens, what, what's happening. So he goes on, simply the renewal of their labor power and to fundamentally and practically weaken the, the Marxist theory of class struggle. So I think in a way he is talking about this, that the theory at least that he knows of, I mean, it's not Althusser. I mean, he, of course he's gonna know that, uh, you know, uh, philosophical practice is class struggle in theory, you right. know, which is an Althusserian notion, et cetera. It's not only Althusser, it's Marx, you know, who, who, who knew this very well, and as early as the thesis uh, on uh, Feuerbach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a very good journal out of Australia, by the way, thesis 11 that came out of Australia many years mm. ago. Okay, the problem is that the surplus, and this is interesting because this is his reading of the theories of surplus value, the fourth, fourth volume of capital, you know, Marx writes the theories of surplus value, has by necessity been redistributed, this is interesting, to proletarianized producers who have become consumers led towards the end of the 20th century to the destruction of their libidinal energy. Mm. Right? And to its decomposition into drives, this is very important in my opinion. I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but this is a very interesting you know, thought right here that how this has happened. The result of what Marcuse in 1955, I'll go back to this, he writes Eros and Civilization, 1955, and he talks about repressive desublimation. We must therefore engage in a critique of libidinal economy. You know, not only a critique of political economy, but the new critique must be of libidinal economy. A new critique of political economy is necessary, and it must also constitute a pharmacological critique of libidinal economy. Freudian theory will only allow these questions to be advanced to the extent that it too is confronted with the question of the pharmacon, that is, the fetish. And with the question of grammatization, such as it transforms fetishism, which takes place through an analysis of the role of hyponemata, exteriorization of memory, memory in the machine, right, etc. Right. I, I, in the, his, in the history of desire and sublimation, the transitional object being a kind of proto hyponematon and proto fetish, while contemporary hyponemic uh, ne nemesic objects or hyponemata that henceforth link networks together, right? Okay, Richard, go ahead. And then, I, but I wanted to go on a little bit with it. Oh, go on, go on, go on, go on. Okay, so the proletization, proletarianization of the consumer is an epoch of libidinal economy, and, and the crucial task of the new critique of political economy is to construct a genealogy of this economy which is a pharmacology, the genesis of which is indissociable from organological, logical becoming and grammatization. This pharmacology raises the question of trans-individuation, right, insofar that it can produce long circuits of individuation as well as short circuits, that is, disindividuation. And going back to what you say, Andrew, I think this is the kernel, if you will, of what you were talking about, 
you know, in terms of new practices of artists in this void. Where he's speaking about new short circuit, long circuits of individuation, as well as short circuits, which that is disindividuation. And he's really looking at this in this larger process of psychic and collective individuation. So what Plato calls, and I, I just want to set up this opposition, and, and then please, Richard, uh, feel free. And a nemesis is hence founded on a dialectic. And this is the dialogical commerce through which in, in, in interlocution, that is a dialogism that I also understand in Bakhtin's sense of the term. And for those of you that didn't have not read the dialogical imagination, please read it. It's really phenomenal work. This is something that used his, his dissertation manuscript for cigarette rolling paper when he was, uh, you know, sent out to the countryside during the Stalinist, uh, you know, period in, in, in the Soviet Union. Okay, long circuits, right? Sorry? Just again, what is it? Ba ba Bakhtin, B-A-K-T-H-I-N, Bakhtin, yeah, yeah. Mikhail Bakhtin. Also, probably his other name was Voloshinov, wrote a book called Marxism and the Philosophy of Language, which is crucial investigation was the difference between ideological signaling, which may be what Black Lives Matter, versus material sign. You know, this is something mm -hmm. interesting to consider in linguistic capital, right? Okay. What's the title again? Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Marxism. Marxism in the Philosophy of Language, right? Yeah. Uh, anyway, long circuits of trans-individuation or form, which tend to be short-circuited by the poisonous uses to which the sophists put the literal pharmacon. Most, more generally, if the grammatization of perception, and this is going back to what you were saying about visual, you know, paranoia, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you were, you're speaking both of uh, paranoia and oral regression together, right? If the grammatization of the central nervous system or the nervous system, insofar as the seat of the affects, can lead to the proletarianization of consumers, that is, destroy their savoir vivre, their, their know -how, knowing how to live, as well as the savoirs of which the arts of living can procure. This is because libidinal economy, in general, constitutes circuits of desire within a process of trans-individuation through which libidinal energy is formed and accumulated. But this is also a process in which grammatization may either create long circuits, and it gives you alternatives here. That is, accumulate libidinal energy by intensifying individuation. And I, again, I think going back to this question of the void or the abyssal plane, this is somewhat of a, you know, I'm not saying this is an ethos he's trying to create. It's kind of a prescriptive moment, right? Intensify and, and give objects of desire to the individual that in infantize his or her individuation, um, you know, and he goes on to Simon shows that individuation is structurally unachievable and in this sense infinite because these objects can only be given as infinite and incommensurable. So revolution is always incommensurable. We don't know what revolution leads to. It is the possibility that it's higher than the actuality always, always part of a contingent risk. And then the other one is to provoke, and I, I like this, short circuits, that is disindividuation, and consequently, de-sublimation, that is the commensurable finitization of all things lives in living to the destruction of libidinal energy. Grammatization is infinitely pharmacological, and hyponemica can therefore either proletarize the psyche, it affects or individuate the psyche. So the deproletarianization is really a process of re-individuation, re-enchantment, etc., by processes of short circuit circuiting. You can see the psychoanalytic dimension here in a way of transferential energy, etc. The, the logic of the transference is working here. He's also using, you know, thermodynamics and he's using language of 19th century. Uh, you know, physics and, and the second law of thermodynamics. Anyway, so, I mean, you know, uh, so Richard, you wanted to say something. I'm sorry. He goes into, in the sense of the, the 
the, 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 the pharmacon here. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, Everybody, but I mean, yeah. my thing was, you know, again, I just, uh, you know, at, at one point he starts here, he talks about the Freudian theory. This is on page uh, 41. Right. Freudian theory will only allow these questions to be advanced to the extent that it too is confronted with the question of the pharmacon that is the fetish. And I'm trying to, I'm just trying to understand that. And with the question of grammatization, such as it transforms fetishism which takes place through an analysis of the role of uh, hypomimeta in the, uh, in the history of desire and sublimation, the transitional objects being a kind of proto hymnemet and proto-fetish. Um, you know, I mean, just to unpack that, I'm just trying so that the, um, so that, you know, so that the pharmacon has kind of a, uh, a phallic role. It 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 somehow um, uh, what it it puts uh, the the man in uh, able to uh, uh, stand the presence of femininity because he projects a phallus onto the woman and therefore this uh, helps him to. I, I mean, so that so constantly. Um, I, I mean, I'm just trying to understand what he's saying here. Um, uh, so that constantly this um, uh, exomatization is a way of, of dealing with the, the real of the body, uh, which somehow is made, um, you know, inscribed in, um, in culture through this uh project through it the way it's i mean is 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 that what he's i'm, I'm just trying to understand what the hell he's uh, well, I talking think, about. i think at one level he's trying to take on uh, the, the 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 uh, the lack of um you know uh freudian theory really talking about the new you know the new digital economies if you will mm. and in in a sense and that somehow the new fetish is really in the hyponemata. It's the exteriorization of objects, right, in a sense. And that there is no really ultimately, you know, in the Winnicottian uh, sense, transitional object, right, in, 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 a, in a way, right? It is no longer, you know, the encounter, if you will, with the, with, uh, the fetishized uh, object. It's almost taken for granted in some ways, right? And it becomes part of this externalization, exteriorization of memory. It's no longer about the recollective process that is part of the psychoanalytic praxis, right? He's not, you know, he, he's going to bring that in later because the, the opposition here is between the anonymic that is able to recollect, right? Bring the subject, as you pointed out two, three sessions ago, to the myotic, right? To that moment of the midwifing or at the, mid, the moment of the analyst as a, you know, a Socratic midwife or the role of the midwife that leads the analyst on to the point of, in the Lacanian sense, the passage, right, or the, 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 the passwords, so right. Think, right? Or, or, or the kind of abreaction or, you know, in the, in the, the other, other sense and more traditional psychoanalytic, uh, the cathartic, right, in a sense. He is saying that this is not really operative, right, in today's Freudian theory anymore, right? He's looking, looking at that and what, what's happening. And because everything is being part of, part of the identification is the consumption, right? It really is the consumption. We don't have the, you know, really in a sense, yes, of course, Trump is part of a kind of return of the repressed, of, of the phallocentric universe, misogynist and all of that. That goes without saying, and the white masculinity and all this kind of stuff, and all these revenge of these, this, this kind of culture. At the same time, what's going on at the same time is the identification with the, with the objects. Just look at the militarization of the police. What they say, we're going to need more. We need more lasers. Look at the discourses that are going on right now. This is all about technical objects. It's not about just logistics, spacing, and all of that. It's about what is the weapon 
you know, what, and, and, and that weapons fetishize, you know, destructive potential or control potential. Yes. Yeah, this so I, I think this is, I think this is what, what's going on here. He's seeing this as part of an ongoing proletarianization, right? That he mm -hmm. wants to encounter. And, he, and for some reason, I, I don't know, um, you know, he, he is also saying here that maybe they stopped short too, the Freudians, right? Of understanding this in the social, you know, uh, uh, domain, if you will, right? That it's all, all too much about the individual and the trauma and this, and he's looking at this in a broader context. I'm not sure, I'm just trying to unpack, you know, at yeah. multiple levels here, right, yeah. To me, it also brings up, you know, what Lydia brought up in terms of anxiety and, and uh, right. also of ma masculinity and castration. Or, I mean, a, a number of people have pointed out to kind of, you know, trans or you know, uh, transformation or focus on uh, this kind of uh, violent uh, uh, expression of masculinity that seems to mm. be. So, yeah, it's so prevalent, um, and I don't know if it's, we're more focused on it or is it because it actually exists more, but I do get a sense of just this kind of amazing uh, number of, of men who are equipping themselves with, uh, with, these, with these kind of phallic exomatizations of, you know, uh, you know I'm thinking of guns, yeah. but, you know, just, just a tremendous tremendous, um, you know, and, and these soldiers that we see in Portland and such, who not by chance are facing down mothers. Um, you know, you, 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 it's a very interesting um, uh, kind of, but you know, to go to, to Zizek's point or something, I'm not sure, you know, the relation to patriarchy seems to some people very obvious, but to me, it's far from it. I mean, and there's a there's a kind of you know these these guys seem to me so so threatened, you know, so cast well, you know, mm. uh, so threatened by the idea of castration um, that there's just this amazing. Uh, um, display of, vi of violence as violence. they're kind of mm. it, it, it's quite it's quite striking um, that that's maybe off the topic Richard here, but yeah 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 I so I so uh, I believe this passage is simply a claim uh, of Stiegler for Deleuze and Gattari I think it's simply right. a long-winded entree into schizoanalysis versus a classical Freudian Oedipal fixation. I think that's all he's trying to do with that entire paragraph. Nothing to do with gender, or maybe even the fetish. But but the fetish yeah. is, uh, the fetish is not the same as the phallus, and it's not only men who who uh, want it or lack it. Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah, it can. Right. and also isn't. I mean, you know. Thank you. The, I'll just say that the Lacanians, or some of them, I think, are not, it's not so much, you know, the whole thing about, it's not so much about the, about the individuated subject. I mean, the subject is decentered, the subject is very social. I mean, I think, I think with, yes. with Lacan, you can move into, uh, th there is, might, there might be even some corroboration with, you know, the idea of pro the deep of proletarianization, you know, the, the fact that the subject, I think, there's an essay by Zizek, you know, on, on the subject is void actually in Lacan. The subject isn't even there. So I feel like there's. But we're there's not a, talking about that in this paragraph at all. None of that's no, really, there. That's true. That's it's true. Just and Lydia problem. is right because what he's really doing yeah. is he's playing he's on right. something I didn't read earlier, which was the quote from Anti Oedipus, in, in which primitive territorialism, et cetera, and deterritorialization is put out there you know, the Territorium machine in terms of encoding and flows. So in some ways, Stiegler is taking up the Deleuzean, Guattarian moment of, you know, schizoid flows, and that the schizoid on the walk is a much better example of deproletarianization, you know, of, of proletarianization, et cetera, and what's going on today, and is a much better model than the neurotic on the couch or, you know, the yeah. quote, yeah, yeah. 
the social. But he is making some music like, oh, claims yeah. though about about fetish that I I I would want to unpack a little yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think he just uses this word, you know, and I mean, doesn't really explain what he's really trying to do here. But I think that the fetish is related for him to the pharmacon, right? This is what he's really trying to do. He's trying to set up later in the in the essay this whole thing on uh, on uh, the uh, pharmacon, you know, his reading of uh, Plato's pharmacy, because he's really, in in a way, the pretext for all of this. If we want to go back just for a second, um, 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 uh, you know, he, he, he's really t talking about Daddy Don's great essay, Plato's Pharmacy, which, in which the pharmacon is really elaborated. So he's, he's presupposing this in this section, right? Um, yeah, and, and in a way, again, the pharmacology is a way of kind of getting us back to short circuiting you know, the, 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 this process of proletarianization, systemic stupidity, all these things. So I think this is a, a part, part of uh, what's, uh, you know, uh, what's up here. So I don't think he's using fetish in the sense of psychoanalytic uh, fetish, right? I, I, you know, I, maybe he's using it in the dual notion of the fetish of the commodity as well as the fetish of the, in the body, right? Together, yeah? But go ahead, I, I'm sorry. I, no, I, at some point, I'd love to just talk briefly. I have another quote, starts on page 48, about the economy of contribution. But I, I wanted to ask you about that, you know, um, where he goes and he ends up, uh, the, uh, the, end, the second to last paragraph, he says economy of contribution. And then he goes on to say on 48 at the very bottom, if dissociation results from short circuits and trans, trans individuation, made possible by the pharmacon emerging from that process of grammatization in which in the epoch of reticulated capitalism, cognitive technologies, and digitalized cultural technologies are formed, then the formation, and this is kind of the other side, the flip side of the pharmacon, the formation right. of, an, of an associated socio-technical milieu is the alternative to this poisonous becoming of grammatization. Such an alternative presupposes, however, a veritable revolution of the dominant industrial model, which may fall short of an overthrow, renversement of capitalism, but which would certainly be a revolution of capitalism. And right. this interests me in terms of, you know, going back to what is his relationship to, to Marxism, to Marx, to the concept of revolution, you know, recently someone who I I learned I learned uh, uh, I learned capital from him was David Harvey, who recently has gotten in trouble. You you know David Harvey, I, yeah. I do. You I know. do know David. Right. <laughs> uh, and a uh, wonderful my experienced reader of of capital, um, but has recently fallen out of favor with some of the uh, faithful. Uh, for say, for kind of saying uh, where capitalism uh, is now uh, is so beyond where Marx imagined mm. it in terms of the way it's embedded in the survival of mass numbers of, uh, of the majority uh, of you know, human life. Uh, one cannot uh, imagine pulling the plug capitalism one has to imagine a different kind of overturning or yeah. and so it's and so it's interesting here too is he's kind of you know how he's it seems to me and i wanted to gather people's sense of this that he's kind of you know he's thinking through a different kind of transition or transformation it's not reformation. It's certainly not reforming capitalism. No, no it's not a no. reformation. It's a revolution <laughs> in capital. And if you want to yeah. go back to Gramsci, who understood this well, in some ways, it's a revolution within capital that you know goes beyond its insane limit where it is today, right? In a way. So Stiegler is not proposing, quote, the alternative socialism or the alternative communism or whatever, or anarchy in a way, he still thinks that, you know, we're stuck with this system. 
I mean, I, I'm putting I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth, but probably he says that. Right. How are you going to defeat this, really? I mean, with what? You know, <laughs> you know, some people on the streets in Portland. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, it may be the beginning of a movement and an uprising and an upsurge and in consciousness, et cetera. But is this going to really tear down the system? It may be a beginning of something, yes, and it may be a, a great bump in the road or a kind of, you know, derailing of certain aspects and, you know, set up some good reformist movement. And that's the hope at this point. But in terms of the destruction of the system, I think Stiegler, David Harvey, where he's coming from too, is enough of a realist to think that the contradictions in the system are not going to defeat the system, right? In a sense, right. right? And even a little bit of the push to the edge doesn't do it. So the best we can come up with is try to say, how can we make this work to, quote, trans individuations benefit? How can we get back to the point of where we can maybe talk again about the promise of the whole human being? Can we begin to do this intergenerationally, right. transgenerationally? So this aspect of Marx, which to me was always the most attractive part, in a way, certainly Soviet bureaucracy is not attractive to me, or, or whatever, or, you know, or, or Cheka, or whatever. Ever, although, you know, I mean, I understand this in terms of state realism, but I mean, in a way, the, the dream of the whole person, the real dream of what was called the new man, you know, it was not the new woman, but, you know, we can, we can you know, certainly talk about that as well, uh, or, or whatever. But, but, but anyway, all to say, um, I think this is where he's going. You know, how does the species itself, by uses language of biosphere, right, he'll use the uh, negotrope you know, instead of the Anthropocene, because he doesn't want to be considered a humanist, but he thinks the potential is there for something radically different, right, in a way. But he's not going to call it DSA-styled socialism. He's not going to call it, you know, or social democracy. He's not going to call it the Leninist break. He's not going to use these kind of terms, or that he's a Luxembourgist, although there's a lot of Luxembourg here that I can read into this, you know, uh, in terms of spontaneity, et cetera, right? That, that, that's also occurring. So, yes, so, I mean, I, he is not, quote unquote, a Marxist as we would define a Marxist. There's no question about that. Right. Uh, Unfortunately, to his deficit, I think. <laughs> okay, but why would that be so? I mean, what, what, what would you argue? I mean, I think that, the, you know, if you want to talk about, um, you know, I think Marxism and uh, certainly aspects of Marxist theory uh, has accounted for a lot of what Stiegler lays out here. I mean, I would point to just in general, you know, even Jameson's political unconscious. I think, uh, you know, when the way he talks about overcoming the modes of production, I think anticipates uh, exactly this point uh, that we need to go beyond capital, but it's within the frame, uh, Marxist framework. You know, it's not, it's not a violent revolution by any means, uh, which I would, I would also sort of support to a degree. But I think that, uh, but I think that it's it's definitely present in Marxist literature, and I think I think maintaining uh, to some degree a sort of um, uh, well, you know an unorthodox Marxism, I think is is politically um, right. But I don't think Stiegler throwing out the unorthodox Marxism. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean he lumped them all in. His language of this, I mean, proletarianization to him means something different than it did in the 19th century, and and does to a lot of the, the tradition. I mean, he's, he's working with terms here in terms of new processes. And unless we look at phenomena as it comes up to us today, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that Stiegler's anti-Marxist either, right? I'm just saying that this, oh. is, this is not for a, yeah. a, a follower, right? In, in a sense, he's not, he's not against Marx. He, you know, in fact, uh, I mean, you, you read him carefully enough, there's an incredible, uh, uh, not only influence, but, uh, you know, very deep admiration and use of Marx's work, right? Definitely. In a I sense, agree. Right? Right. But it's also through the lens of post-structuralism, right? Uh, that Absolutely. is also operative here, too, you know, that is happening. You know, that, uh, you know, the early Marxist tradition did not take into account a Vygotsky, who's a first-rate psychologist, you know, wrote a book against Freud, against Freudianism, right? The Soviet Union, you know, if it wasn't for Althusser, probably would have never heard of Freud in yeah. some ways. I mean, you know, post, I mean, they knew about Freud, but in a way, or 
of psychoanalytic theory. I mean, you know, in, in, in a sense. And, and uh, so I, I think he's bringing in multiple disciplines here in a way. So this becomes sort of like a Tony Wilden, if you know the book, System and Structure, Essays in uh, Exchange uh, and uh, Communication, you know, where you're, you're looking at the best <laughs> of the Marxist tradition, but you're also bringing in to the most recent advances that, you know, the thinking could bring, you know, yeah. in a sense. And I'm not saying we become Stieglerian at all. I think that should be a, a hearing here. Does this yeah. work in a sense that, you know, this division between we are no longer under capital wage labor relations because work, you know, we work way beyond the employer, right, at this point, way beyond the employment contract. You know, he's, he's looking at this in terms of techno, you know, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, you know, he's looking at, you know, again, how this systemic stupidity is re really being created by this system that capitalism has made us, you know, very, very uh, uh, stupid. You know, Norman O'Brien says this. He says this in Life Against Death. Capitalism has made us so stupid, we only think in terms of the O and the ought. We only think in Kantian categories in terms of necessity. Yeah, this is all true. But in a way, I'm not, I'm not so sure he's, uh, you know, I mean, he's certainly against the orthodoxy. Yeah. I mean, you know, in a way, he's, he doesn't want to get into that, that kind of thing. And again, this is a, this is a group of people and again, I, I'm not really trying to defend him, just to say this is where he's situated. This is someone who has a very advanced group of, 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 of researchers, right? Uh, you know, that is sitting at the Pompidou Center, that is working with architects, engineers, doctors, et cetera. I think his reflections on the virus were very good, which is on YouTube in his little discussion with the, uh, the uh, gentleman, the philosopher from Morocco. You know, where he talks about what the virus now has the tendency to do to us is homogenize us. You know, we're all becoming the same, right? <laughs> the processes of individuation, again, are being cut off. We're being universalized. I've experienced this. I'm not an essential worker. I can't get into Canada. I'm being homogenized, you know, in terms of, you know, how I'm constituted by the state, how we're being yeah. all, all being constituted in a sense, yeah, how we, you know, lean on the statistics. So anyway, I mean, I hear you, Josh, yeah. I mean, I think he's dealing with a different kind of political unconscious than yeah. a Jameson, too. You know, in a way. he's yeah. looking at, you know, um, he's looking at finance capital, yeah. Remember, he's writing this 2009, and Jameson writes, writes political unconscious, I think, in 1991, right, in, in, in some ways. And, you know, this is also... A kind of trying to update a critique of the new political economy that takes into account the derivatives. How do you explain, honestly, the stock market, the NASDAQ index, the technology index hitting all time highs during a, a, a depression of 40 million people out of work? Right? I mean, this is depression scale bodies that are without, quote, official employment. You know, how, how do we begin to analyze this? You know, I mean, we don't have straight categories to do so for Marx. It's not about labor, wage labor and capital in a certain way. Yeah. I mean, capital doesn't have the money. Of course they have the money you know, to do this, right? You, you see what the stimulus packages can do to, towards corporate welfare, et cetera, right? So, I mean, uh, these are just things I think we live with that we need, we need new analytical categories for. I think this is what radical imagination is, is really about how do you reroute this phenomena that we're going going, going uh, uh, through now? Yeah, in a sense. Uh, how, how, how do we talk about this? Yeah. I would I welcome uh, yeah. any of those titles, any titles that would um, help us with that project for the next series of Left Forum. What's, what's beyond these categories? I, am, I, I really am um, uh, hoping to read more. Beyond what, which categories? What, tell me what you mean by that. No, I mean, we're, we're, the, we're the, talking the, about the, 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 um, now? Yeah. The, yeah. the the transformation of class struggle beyond the traditional categories. That's right. what I mean. Right. Right. So if, well, I'm going to do a course on Plato for revolutionaries. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'll, I'll promise to go into the Pharmacon, but it's going to be a reading of the Republic through the categories of what do we mean by justice? <laughs> what do we mean about harmony of the spheres? 
What do we mean by education? What do we mean by imitation? What is art, right, <laughs> et cetera? All these kind of questions to be re-raised. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna read Plato in terms of how the tradition has uh, uh, translated him. We're gonna read the CDC Reeve translation of the actual book, Politia. Uh, and then we're gonna read also Alain Bajou's rewriting of the Republic in which he brings a woman to become Socrates' nemesis. So we're gonna do a, a parallel reading. That's, that's my idea of how we start to get beyond categories, right, in a certain way. How do we rethink justice and power? You know, because in a way, I think again, look, Mar the Marxist tradition in some ways has never really given us an adequate theory of the state or theory of power, you know, in, in a certain way, you know? We've had to go to Foucault. For, why do people take these 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 moves, right, to say Michel Foucault on power in a sense? Because there's a lack of fulfillment, even though Nicolas Poulain-Sas had a very good good work on political power. People weren't satisfied enough, so they they moved to Foucault. You know, in terms of uh, you know uh, the examination of power and the birth of the biopolitical. And what does that mean? Are we in a biopolitical epoch? You know, we have thinkers out there that are very, that really think historical materialism is not enough. And how do there, we go beyond those categories? So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just throwing out some thoughts here. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, I have, I mean, you know, just to show you how close I am to Marx, you know, uh, my, my girlfriend's not here, but I have the puppet Marx, you know, that's in my, my room, right? So I have the professor himself, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, I mean, you know, listen, I mean, he's still the thinker of our, our times and the thinker of the horizon. The thing is, is how do you build new categories? How do you overturn and how do you do so with good logic? That, that's the point. You just don't want to create neologisms that are reactionary. I don't find Stiegler reactionary or I wouldn't be reading him so deeply. Michael? Well, he's reactionary. He may not be right, but he's not reactionary. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I want to say, uh, Somebody, somebody's been hanging around this for me. Has been is Kojin Karatani, who yeah, wrote, great yeah. who wrote the structure of world history, and he talks about the this triadic nexus of capital, nation, and state yes. as being one way in which, yeah, um, maybe I don't know classical Marx, Marxism, which I don't know what that is, but right, right. Would, would kind of underestimated this concept of the nation, which is which is, I guess, um, it, 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 it's the, in other words, it's not just the state, it's, it, it's, it's the mind of the people right. that, that are, that have internalized the necessity for state right. and, and the necessity for um, perpetuation of exploitative reactionary modes so i think he's pretty interesting and i think stiegler actually mentioned him in that little video yes. i think this is a was... very good piece i'll see if i can find it it's called capital is spirit by koshin Gardani that i have in my stiegler file so anyway he uh, he's uh, he's very good on this a book of his i i really recommend is where he shifts on the Marxist orthodoxy in a way. He shifts radically where he says we should read through modes of exchange, yes. not modes of production. So yes. it's an anti Jameson and an anti, you know, uh, Bali Bomber Althusser in a way. So Caritani is, is very good. Yeah. K A R A N T A N I, Kojin. He, he taught it. I have the PDF. Over. Very radical. Very I'm radical. Gonna, I'm going to uh, send the PDF. Yeah. Yeah, he's really, really, really good. Uh, really, really a smart man. Yeah, he wrote a, an excellent right. book on the history of Japanese uh, literature, as well. Could you and, uh, explain? Yeah, he's an extraordinary uh, uh, thinker. Yeah, I'm sorry. Could you could you explain how? Yeah, the idea of the uh, of of moving beyond modes of production, seeing well, he, the, he, all he, the, he into of, of exchange, or really the starting point. Yeah, modes of Not exchange modes of production. This yeah, and, and how, but how does that relate to what Stiegler's political economy? Well, I think it's very close in some ways. I mean, you know, in a lot of ways, because Stiegler's looking at 
at consumer and looking at consumption as a sphere. His production is already there in the industrialization of memory, et cetera. If you want to think this through the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the standard categories of uh, production, consumption, uh, and distribution, and exchange, which are the four basic categories that Marx elaborates in the critique of political economy, right? And this is in the introduction to the Penguin edition of the Grundrisse. So, you know, you, you will see that Marx is looking at this as a Hegelian totality. And this is, you know, one of Marx's great Hegelian moments, right, in, in, in a sense, right? Looking at the overlapping between all of this, okay? And in the tradition, you have groups that start to date history through shifts in the modes of production. You know, so the cotton jenny and the invention of the steam engine shift, right? Those inventions will shift us to the mode of production called the industrial revolution, right? And, you know, you have this through machines, et cetera, et cetera, right? Et cetera. What, what, what Stiegler is saying, that that shift is happening much more through techniques, right? <laughs> and through, you know, externalization of memory. He's doing this phenomenologically, not just through the political economy. He's looking at the actual phenomena as a whole. So Karatani wants to look at this first and foremost as a predicate, the modes of exchange. Yes. So he'll go through this as the, the dominant motive, whereas in Marx, it's the productive sphere. So Stigler has many an antecedents in terms of his arguments. Jacques Ellul, right, is, is uh, you know, one who talked about Marxism and, and communism is a productivist ideology, that it's no different than capitalism. You know, Lenin was very excited about Taylorism. Huh. <laughs> very excited. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, yeah, really in a way. I mean, it wasn't a different laborer at work. It was about massive, rapid industrialization at some levels, you know, coming out of an agricultural belt. And remember that all the revolutions in the uh, 20th century or the revolutions really were agricultural uh, uh, societies, right? Russia was a back, backward czar to the serfdom, right, in a way, still trapped in a feudal society. The Chinese Mao was the greatest agricultural uh, communist of all. And Fidel, I mean, what was he dealing with? Illiteracy and an economy of tobacco, you know, tourism and, uh, and sugar, right? And, uh, and, and, and coffee, right? This is what, what, what they had. So Marx's prediction about this happening in the advanced nations didn't come to fruition, even though the most militant, the most sophisticated readings obviously came out of England, Germany, France, right? And then, of course, Eastern Europe in terms of studies and, and the early Soviet you know, work is unbelievable when you look at this. I mean, you know, their, their interpretations, right? So in, in a lot of ways. So, so yeah, so Garadani comes around and said, says that, you know, no, we should be built this, the structure of world history should be built on modes of exchange, shifts in modes of exchange right. from the temporality, right, in a sense. Marcel and it goes through many cultures on this level, right, and tries to rework it into a very elaborate system. I'm not so sure he pulls it off, but it is an attempt to get out of the productivist and at the same time, the modes of production and, you know, this, this kind of a structural causality that a lot of people speak to, right, in, in many ways. I, I, yeah, yeah. I do like the way Stiegler says the response to, uh, he, he uses the, uh, uh, he creates these acronyms. Uh, there, uh, Tona, uh, there is no, there is no alternative. Toa is we need the Tola syndrome instead of the uh, instead of the uh, the Tina syndrome. Okay. Right? The Tola, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To go around with T-shirts, you know, the Tola. There are lots of yeah, alternatives. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, actually, um, 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 uh, the uh, 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 Matt put up. Thank you, Matt, for the Karatani and the uh, Bakhtin. So you have plenty of reading for the, re the rest of the summer. Yeah. The Karatani is really a really first rate book. I really, I really like him. I find his best book is on uh, uh, where he uses Kantian categories against the Hegelian in, a, in his notion of critique. Yeah, he's a very good. And Zizek actually writes the introduction to that 
in terms of the mirror and the petite object out, the parallax view, which is taken from mm. the film, the parallax uh, view as right. well. So that, that's another mm. interesting moment. Yeah, so Garitani is, is a certainly fair guy. I will, I don't think he's I don't think he's especially well. It would be great to get him as a speaker, you know, in in the states. He gave lectures at Columbia in the night. He was on the faculty at Columbia in the early '90s, I think, and where a lot of this was articulated, et cetera. And you know, for those of you who don't know Japanese communist history, but you know, very very militant part, you know, and the Red Queen ended up with the PLO, teaching them how to arm themselves. Back in the early 70s, she was George Agash's lover, right, in a, in a way. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, they have a very long history of, uh, you know, militant action, including violent action. I mean, you know, very different level than the, the Japanese. So, um, yes. yeah. So, Karatani comes out of a very, very interesting tradition, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know if he still smokes but he was a chain smoker so i don't know how well he is <laughs> but anyway you know he'd sit there at the podium and then and, and, and chain chain smoke but yeah no i'm glad you brought him up i mean in a way the stiegler karatani are two interesting attempts if you will to both extend and you know encounter Marx on a critical basis and try to develop something new against the tradition Right of the interpretations, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Three mo three modes of exchange, I guess. Yes. You know, and and then he's calling for the fourth mode of exchange would be mode of exchange A. Right. But at a higher right. dimension. Yes. Yes. And he analyzes the history, you know, from the nomadic age before from before territoriality yeah. and before, before territoriality exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he's the one who had the, uh, uh, what was it called? The Associationist Movement. Yes. And, he, and he actually, uh, they had that special currency that they used too. You know, uh, uh, it was a Cornell, I think in Ithaca, that you were paid in, uh, I forgot the name of it. It's not plenty, that's in North Carolina. There was another currency. You know, he was very much for the Tobin tax too. If you know the Tobin tax, which was a tax on all stock exchange. You know, this economy, just if you put a two cents tax, uh, you know, you could probably even do one cent. Two cents tax would take care of all the federal debt and give guaranteed income to everybody in this country of about 45, 50,000 a year and guaranteed health care. Just one little penny on each trans, every time a buying and selling of the security. And you could do that on a, you know, on a basis where it goes up if you buy a million shares of Zoom at $250,000, $250 a share, that transaction should be taxed at two cents, right? You know, it's a give more back, right? Et cetera. You can have a, you know, an upward scale, not a sliding scale, right? <laughs> so anyway, an ascending scale. So um, anyway, th this, these are things, you know, worth talking about. Yeah, but I'm glad you brought up Karjani. He's very much in this moment of people that are not read that actively in the universities. Uh, you know, that's part of the problem, and especially within the Marxist tradition, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially within the Marxist tradition. Yeah, and you know, uh, but I think it's good to be open to this thing, um, uh, you know, to the, these moments, right? Uh, very, very important to, 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 to think this through. You know, I mean, look, the United States has been dominated by the Derridians, right, on the one hand, and then in the literary departments, Althusser never really made it, except through Fred Jameson and a few other people, you know, that read. But Althusser never really made it into the philosophical or literary circles. I mean, I remember when I was at Johns Hopkins, you know, Althusser was not in the book of textual strategy. And that was for a reason, right? And textual strategies was a, a book used with the graduate students. So this becomes part of what quote principles of selection of what one gets in education, right? Too, and you know what becomes part of the dominant, you know, discourse out there. So we're left, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, I love Georgie Lukács, but how many times can we read the theory of reification? You know what I mean? Yeah, sure, it's still going on. It's worth knowing. It's very dense and it's very substantive, et cetera. But, you know, how about from reification to proletarianization? You know, Lukács never talks about systemic stupidity. And I mean, if you take a look around and you listen to 95% of what's being said, you're wondering what planet you're on. I mean, what happened? 
you know, what, what frozen zone took place for the last 25, 30 years, you know, in so many ways. I mean, you know, when you really think about it, the talking heads, the everything, really, even on the talk show, I mean, you know, even democracy now, you know, which um, maybe, you know, 10, 15 years ago, really stuff, you know, every other word is explained, you know, you listen, you know, you listen, you know, tell us about it, explain, right? <laughs> you know, exactly. There's no dialogue. I mean, it's, 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 it's a strange, you know, in this way. I'm not, yeah. I mean, with um, all one due, thing I was wondering, respect. Michael. What's that? I'm sorry. One thing I was wondering about, yeah, uh, sure. and, yeah. and I, and I think, you know, I agree with Ziegler on this point too, about the yeah. general yeah, polarization yeah. Um, being like a huge problem. And, and more symptomatic of our condition. But I was wondering how this, you know, politarization sits with, um, with sort of the, the, you know, the idea of class as, uh, you know, class is as class does, the sort of Aronowitz kind of conception of um, uh, class formation. And if there was sort of, you know, uh, a way to think class, you know, like that instead of as, as just sort of uh, lumping everybody into this general right. community. Um, right. Yeah. No, well, I don't I, think, I think the, the critique of class is that he <laughs> sees the disappearance, right? It's <laughs> both classes. He's looking at, quote, the manifesto in terms of the two class argument that plays out in so many senses, right? Because he's also talking about proletarianization as a kind of negative, not as a positive, right? right. It's not the proletariat that took power. Right? <laughs> yeah, et cetera, yeah. right? It was able to build the culture, right? And this was always the problem too. Did the did the proletariat really build the culture and in these in these uh you know um yeah in these uh in these uh quote revolutionary upsurges that that's always been an issue in some yeah, and, that, and I would say that's the general in, in general why I get a little bit uh since sometimes when when you know we give so much credence to art art and and sort of the cultural forms, you know, is that they're all essentially ideological manifestations of the bourgeoisie anyway, and protected right. by them, you know, and, and to really to, to produce a, you know, uh, meaningful art, I think would be, is, is much more dramatic than, than thinking, you know, anywhere near our categorical forms, I'd say, you know. Right. Like to your point of, you know, the culture of the proletariat ultimately, or Lukashian. Right you know, subject to object <laughs> unity. Right, right, right. Well, it was a very different time. I mean, another great text to read here is The Problem of Generations, if you're interested in this intergenerational thing by Mannheim, in which Mannheim talks about a certain kind of generational mix. That once upon a time, a great generation emerges. The 1850s and 1860s gives birth to Freud, you know, Zimmel is teaching Wittgenstein, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They all come up at the same time. In 1928, 29, 26 to 1930, 31, Jean-Paul Sartre, Claude Lévi-Strauss, Ferdinand Braudel, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, Simone Weil, all of these people are all in the same classes with each other. Maurice Merleau-Ponty, you know, et cetera, et cetera. George Bataille. Uh, you know, everybody's present in certain lectures. So th this to me, you know, again, is something worth considering how that transmission is taking place too. I mean, what is, what is this short circuiting that goes on? How, how does the social space emerge that a Kojev can rock a whole generation for six years, right? <laughs> By teaching Hegel and then a man and then and his friend and also very, very close friend of Lacan, Gurbich, right, could go out and, and, and would give lectures to the proletariat, gave le lectures to workers underground at the end of the day, right? It would go out, who was then picked up by the Gestapo later. So how, did, how does this happen? How did these things really emerge? And then we're left with this work and we, we're, we're trying to not only reinterpret, but use it for our purposes, right? And, and in terms of building something better. So I think this is always important to remember. This is where the anonymics and tertiary retention really comes into to play, I think, you know, in a way, in platonic recollection. And it's no accident that, you know, I mean, you know, Lydia knows this as well as I do, and I'm sure it's part of discussions. Behaviorism, 
cognitivism, you know, all these new types of psychology, dialectical behaviorism, behaviorism as, as such, cognitive, uh, you know, uh, psychology, all these new forms of psychology are displacing psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis is unaffordable to most people at this point. Is it a thing of the past because of its affordability? Can it, can it be, you know, routinized? I mean, you know, in, in a sense. And, you know, yes, you can get, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if insurance companies pay for psychoanalysis uh, at this point. Maybe psychoanalytic directed psychotherapy, but not psychoanalysis so proper that I know of. Anyway, so what happens to this moment that was, you know, incredibly subversive? I mean, Freud is a, an amazing subversive thinker. If you read these quotes, you know, this is to me the importance of Lacan, you know, despite all the all the thing. I mean, this is one of the great readers of Sigmund Freud. He goes back to read him carefully and he understands all the subversion that's taking place there in terms of psychic materiality, etc. So I don't know, Lydia, if you wanted to, to speak this, but it seems to me there's a whole dominant, you know, strand now that is making people dumber and dumber, and dumber and dumber without, you know, any kind of exploratory depth psychology at this point. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's happened, huh? It's a, so it's, a, you know, psychoanalysis is considered to be philosophy, uh, mere philosophy and therefore useless by, um, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues, right? So a lot of my philosophy colleagues think that cognitive science is the only true approach to the psyche and the question of the person. No. Um, so it, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm in agreement with my friend, uh, 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 Ronowitz on this. There's no such thing as philosophy of mind. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can eliminate those people, they're going to the lifelong learning gap. <laughs> so in response to the, to the, uh, them of the, their bourgeois, the, the bourgeois nature of yeah. psychoanalysis, my right. training institute is in the chat. It's I low, see. free or low cost uh, services and they are doing also free groups these days. They're smart and non-invasive. Okay. And they also, they yeah. also believe that uh, it's not intensity that matters, but repetition. So once a week is fine. And, okay, and they, cool. don't, they don't say that it's psychoanalytic psychotherapy. They say that it's psychoanalysis. So. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Imagine you, know, you, you kind of, you negotiate your, um, your rate. Okay. Good. Okay. So thanks, Richard. I see you in the chat. Do you want to? Say something before leaving, or just by, or <laughs> no, just uh, you know, my my great thanks to everyone, especially yeah, you for yeah, uh, yeah, no problem. I, I can do it another week. I mean, I can figure out something if you guys want to do it. It's up to you. I mean, you know, I'm available. I'm not I'm not swamped at this point. You know, but it's up to you. All right, I can figure out a little more of Stiegler to do, and maybe we can address the questions that Josh. And Will, uh, you know, wrote me emails about this this relationship to Marx, the anti-Marxism. What's really I don't think going it's anti-Marxism. I didn't mean to imply that. I just think that it would be like better if he were, <laughs> like okay. you know, in the Baduian, you know, kind of like you know, communi uh, the hypothesis of communism, or you know, that's the word we designate as, you know, the tradition of uh, radical politics or something, you know, in that, in that spirit, ultimately, that's all. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. You know. Okay. Well, I'll send out an email to that effect. Yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, um, yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's up to you guys. I'd be glad to, uh, you know, glad to, um, uh, you know, do another uh, session next week, you know, figure out something that can kind of bring it around, you know, for where we are. I mean, really didn't engage the body tonight, but I did find those passages of where he wants to, you know, engage, uh, you know, the body. As, as, but he doesn't really have a theory, if you will, or a philosophy of body here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, to my mind, the Merleau-Pontys of the world and others, you know, are much more advanced, if you will, 
in terms of phenomenological approach. But he's speaking to making and the absence of making, yeah. and that's, that's to me, that's a total reference to the body. And yes, it is. Yes, yes. No, I agree with you. Making, yes. but he doesn't. Another, but he doesn't articulate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another element of his work that I would love to focus on is his sense of his time. You know, the way okay. he talked about the uh, objects that uh, appear and disappear. Um, uh, talking about, for example, cinema. That, okay. You know, that's another focus in his work I'd love to. I mean, it's, it's a very dense chapter. I, I don't know if we really should read it uh, right now, but it means something you could look. The third chapter, which Stiegler recommended to read before engaging his ontology, is the first chapter of the third volume on cinematic time and techniques in time. Right, right. So, I mean, if you're interested in that, that notion, you know, he, he does, he looks, looks at that's like, uh, and he talks about the Kuleshov effect and other things that you're obviously very familiar with, you know, and a lot of the Russian avant-garde advances mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, cinematic formalism. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So he, he's got that. But yes, we, we can go back to the question of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd okay. So thanks so much. And, you know, and maybe we just think about, you know, maybe we could think about transition. And maybe I could preview a little bit about Plato and, uh, you know, what, what we might be doing and other stuff people would like to, you know, we have, we have some, some uh, you know, range sometimes to, to try to keep things going. Yeah, yeah. So it's up to you. Let me, let me know. What do you guys feel like? You can, you can tell me. If, if enough is enough, it's fine with me. I don't think it personally, believe me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, time would be cool. Let's do something on time. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm okay. in. Time I'm in. in the body. Time, Please. body, and capital. Okay, capital, time, and the body. All right. <laughs> okay. And good. psychology right. and art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Josh, <laughs> I got a call this week that uh, they want me to. They wanted me to do for the Marxist educational project. You know, do Mazaris's book Beyond Capital. I said, there's not a beyond capital. So that's my statement about doing a class on it's von some Mazaros, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just glad I can still go shopping. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you know. yeah it's cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> nice next, to see next. everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, yeah, I hope yeah, everybody stay safe. See you next week then. Okay, great. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. John, thank you for your great comments. You should be a novelist, man. <laughs> <laughs>